Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Stuart Warner. I'm director of the Montesquieu Forum. I'm professor of philosophy at Roosevelt University. And this is the Montesquieu Forum's uh, first event uh, for this semester. Uh, as I, I never tire of saying that the only way in which such enterprises can sustain themselves is with administrative support. And we live in a time in which uh, we're not too quick to praise administrators, uh, but the Dean of my college, Cammie McBride is here, that a Dean is here on a Saturday morning uh, for an event on philosophic poetry and psychology says something. Uh, and my chair, Gina Bacola is here uh, and the director of our honors program, uh, Marjorie Jolis, is also here. Uh, so Roosevelt University is a wonderful place to be, and the Montesquieu Forum is uh, pleased to, to have their support and to have these events. Uh, today we have a conference of four speakers on the subject of philosophic poetry and psychology. Uh, moderating our affairs will be my colleague Svetozar Minkoff, Zarko Minkoff, who's also a professor of philosophy at Roosevelt University. Uh, Rana Berger from Tulane University was indispensable in uh, planning this event and in effect handing it over to the Montesquieu Forum. Uh, and we're uh, grateful to her. Uh, two of the oh, students will be speaking uh, Marina Marin and Alex Limanowski were undergraduates at Roosevelt University. And uh, two of our speakers, Alex Limanowski and Derek Duplessy, were graduate students at Tulane University. Uh, it's been a very happy partnership in marriage. Uh, I'll turn the proceedings over to Zarka. Okay, well, I'll quickly turn them over to, uh, thank you, Stuart, to uh, Professor Marina Marin of the University of Nevada in Reno at, at the moment, who will speak first, and we'll, we'll have, then I'll introduce the other speakers one by one, and we'll have a, a, a melee of a discussion or a melange at the end uh, all, all together. So first, uh, Marina. Thank you, thank you, Zarko. Um, so it is a great pleasure and an honor indeed to be a part of the Roosevelt University Montesquieu Forum event today. Uh, the title of my talk is Comedic Wisdom, a Task for the Humanities in a Democratic State. I did my undergraduate work at Roosevelt and it is always wonderful to be back, albeit virtually, um, like today. I'm very grateful to professors Rana Berger Stuart Warner and Setazar Minkov for organizing the event and for the invitation. Um, what I'm going to read for us today is a shorter version. I offer a more detailed and unfolded analysis in a paper that has an additional two or three sections. <laughs> And so in that longer version, I think further about Mill's model of utilitarianism, and I also draw on Henri Bergson's view of utilitarianism, which for Bergson constitutes the principle of life as such, the principle of all living beings. So another thing that I left out of a discussion um, in this presentation is a deeper analysis of the logic of humor and the way in which this logic, I think, aids in liberating our imagination. What I have prepared for you today are my reflections on the relationship between democracy, Mill's utilitarianism, Bergson's ideas about humor, and my own arguments for the reasons why both liberal education and humor are absolutely indispensable to the well being of a democratic state. So, democracy, at least in principle, seeks to empower the majority while providing for individual liberty. However, this empowerment may weaponize the many, whereby a due democratic process 
could give way to what John Stuart Mill, following Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, refers to as the tyranny of the majority. In the United States of America, as I will argue in this paper, the moral framework of the political regime shows strong affinity with utilitarianism. In its best iterations, and also as Mill conceived of it, utilitarianism seeks to elevate the character and spirit of as many individuals as possible without sacrificing that said individual's uniqueness. In their declining forms, both democracy and utilitarianism repress uniqueness in favor of upholding the views and tastes that serve the ends of the lowest common denominator. Given these weaknesses of democracy and of the moral framework that I align with democracy, that is utilitarianism, I propose that education in a democratic state must cultivate the love of humor. The reason for this lies in the subversive power of humor, which on the one hand draws on and exposes our short-sightedness and ignorance, but on the other hand, can be used to dispel it. Although it throws a wrench into our accustomed view of life, humor alone does not suffice to shake us out of complacency or make us more self-aware. However, if humor becomes a part of liberal education, then it can become a resource on the path to self-examination, without which there is no hope for a long-lasting flourishing of a democratic state. So now I'm going to be talking about Mill on utilitarianism and democracy. John Stuart Mill, who sought to redefine the formulation of utilitarianism, including such as the one proposed by Jeremy Bentham, understood education as being indispensable to a successful utilitarian program. Although it is harder to say what kind of education specifically Mill had in mind, it is clear that the task of education, as Mill saw it, is to cultivate an ethos, a kind of character that would orient the person toward a refined appreciation of pleasure. In On Liberty, Mill stresses the connection between political liberty in a given state and the extent to which that state allows for the cultivation of a unique individuality that uses as the basis of its interests and predilections, not the force of general opinion of the majority, but its own erudition and insight. Mill writes that free development of individuality is one of the leading essentials of well being. It is not only a coordinate element with all that is designated by the term civilization, instruction, education, culture, but is itself a necessary part and condition of all those things. Mill further concludes that if in fact, this view of the individual in her relation to the state was widely held then, and this is Mill now, there would be no danger that liberty should be undervalued and the adjustment of the boundaries between it and social control would present no extraordinary difficulty. But, Mill continues, the evil is that individual spontaneity is hardly recognized by the common modes of thinking as having any intrinsic worth at all or deserving any regard on its own account. On the face of it and in principle, Constitutional democracy as a form of government is supposed to provide for precisely the kind of nourishment of individual uniqueness, talents, and tastes for which Mill advocates. Mill was no stranger to theoreticians and analysts of democracy, but as Terence H. Coulter writes, of all the influences, perhaps that of greatest consequence was Alexis de Tocqueville's democracy in America. Both Tocqueville and Mill saw clearly the dangers of democratic government. In his review of Tocqueville's book, Mill wrote that the experience in America seems to confirm what theory rendered probable, that the tyranny of the majority 
would not take the shape of tyrannical laws, but that of dispensing a power over all laws. Of course, this is democracy not at its best, but in its more deplorable manifestations. But what would be an opposite of a corrupt political arrangement on Mill's schema? It must be the one whereby the state and, it, and also its institutions, and especially in stress educational ones, provide the conditions under which the people, as many as possible, are empowered to render correct judgments as to pleasure. This kind of a polity in spirit and at heart is democracy, because what democracy intends is to empower and elevate the people as many as possible, morally, politically, educationally, and so on. On this presentation, Mill's utilitarianism finds ready home in a democracy. There are scenarios that are familiar to us in which democracy turns into its unseemly lesser self and goes from democratia to ochlocratia, or from the power of the people to the powerful mob. Such a mob, as Plato readily knew, is easily persuaded by likely stories and not by means of speeches that seek to educate the citizens about civil and political virtue. The problem with the degradation of democracy is not solely political or pedagogical in kind, it is also, and I think acutely, a moral problem. Not only does populism exacerbate some of the inherent issues in democracy, for example, the divide between the elite or the wealthy and the majority, it also no longer properly aligns with such principles that seek to guarantee the empowerment and elevation of as many individuals as possible, that is, the very principles that Mill offers as a guide to his understanding of utilitarianism. A demagogue in a declining democracy may inspire the mob to act contrary to such interests of the many as education, health, safety, or the common good. However, and Mill saw it, saw this, one of the great benefits of a well-functioning democracy is the availability of public libraries, schools, and the university. In his 1862 letter to Henry Samuel Chapman, who was British by birth and held public offices then in Australia and in New Zealand, Mill admitted that these educational institutions, as well as the eagerness that's from Mill now for the better sort of new books is very credible to the country. These public goods, are specifically geared toward a refinement of the character and tastes of the people, such a refinement being a prerequisite for a fully flourishing utilitarian society. However, in the very same letter, Mill worried about the tendency in the United States, I quote, to make everything conform to the will, even the passing and momentary will of the dominant majority. This particular feature of evil, and this is still from Mill, which had scarcely begun to show itself in the United States, even when Tocqueville wrote, has made fearful advances since. However, even if democracy were impervious to a devolution into a holocracy, where a mob rules or where the mob is swindled by opprobious interests of the self-seeking individuals, there are further problems that have to do with the moral framework of a political regime that in principle pursues the power of the many. Following Mill's analyses that bring successful utilitarianism in the vicinity of a well-functioning democratic regime, I see in the moral framework of American democracy such utilitarian tendencies that could provide for a flourishing of the political state, but only if a crucial requirement is preserved. This requirement, as Mill saw it, and as I will work here to explain, is education. The education that I have in mind develops an individual's character without inciting rabid individualism. It focuses on a single individual for the sake of empowering all. As I see it, the problem with utilitarianism is two-pronged. First, it has to do with the leveling out of thoughtful political engagement, which consequently 
allows for a rise to power of a self-serving figure or figures that are damaging to the well-being of the many. Second, the issue also concerns education, which must foster individual uniqueness and promote individual flourishing, but in such a way that finds or that focuses on the, the in such a way that this focus on the self does not turn into unbridled, unbridled egoism. Humor then is essential both for the meaningful political engagement and for an education that seeks to develop a person's interest in self-examination. Utility, just one second, I think I might have skipped a place. One has the power to deflate the appeal of inflammatory demagogic rhetoric, and on the other, humor can aid in our search for self-examination. The latter is essential for a thoughtful political life. Now I'm going to speak about humanities in connection to this education as I see it and what it has to do with humor and what humor then has to do with self-knowledge. One aesthetic phenomenon that allows both for the formation of ethical sensibility and that also holds a promise of self-knowledge, which, as I said, is crucial to pursue for, this, for the citizens in a democratic state, this aesthetic phenomenon is humor. This idea may come as a bit of a surprise, but I will rely on Plato and Brixon to elucidate my point. Insofar as humor and self-knowledge are concerned, we read in Plato's Philippus that, I quote, the nature of the ridiculous stands in direct opposition to the attitude recommended by the famous inscription in Delphi. The prescription of the Delphic Oracle, of course, commands, know thyself. The opposite of this injunction is ignorance. Thus, with humor, we have a coin on the opposite sides of which stand on the one hand, the ridiculous, the draws on our ignorance, and on the other, there is self-knowledge that dispels it. Brixon confirms this jointure of comedy and ignorance when he writes that a comic character is generally comic. I'm scrolling. <laughs> this may not be very comic at this point. In proportion to his ignorance of himself. A comic character is generally comic in proportion to his ignorance of himself. However, when we laugh at someone because they are ignorant of the situation or of their role in it, we're also at least invited to imagine ourselves as objects of such laughter. After all, no one is omniscient. It is likely that there are instances in which our ignorance could ignite someone else's laughter. This observation allows us to at least consider what blindfolds and blind spots we may have and thereby to become more aware of our own limitations and downfalls. Therefore, jokes that are well or opportunely made and humor that is well received have a potential to ignite reflection that initiates our search for self-knowledge. This search, as I have also argued in my book on Plato and Aristophanes, Comedy, Politics and the Pursuit of the Just Lie, this search is an ethical core of a thoughtful political participation in a democratic state, which also fosters the preservation of the state. As far as ethical sensibility is concerned, comedy itself is non-didactic because it is a form of art, not a system of educational precepts or principles. In this, as I see it, lies not a weakness, but a great power of humor, Bergson commenting on the aesthetic value of humor observes in that quote that there is something, well, he says aesthetic about it, since the comic comes into being just when society and the individual freed from the worry of self-preservation begin to regard themselves as works of art. Our capacity to be moved by funny moments, to react to them, to understand them, depends on our aesthetic sensibility and our ability to regard the world and ourselves in a disinterested manner. Since, as Bergson suggests, 
humor is aesthetic, and since, as Plato's Socrates indicates, the ridiculous also holds a possibility of self-knowledge, it is through an aesthetic attunement to the world that we become receptive to humor. And further, through this receptivity, we stand to learn how to examine ourselves. The explicitly moral dimension of humor lies in the fact that, and here I quote from Bergson again, any incident is comic that calls our attention to the physical in a person when it is the moral side that is concerned. In other words, comedy brings us to considerations of morality indirectly, not didactically and pedantically, but playfully. This play, which does not prescribe but suggests, does not inculcate, but evokes, offers relief through laughter, but it also offers questions because of the subject and content of the joke. And so Bergson then asks, why do we laugh at a public speaker who sneezes just at the moment, just at the most pathetic moment, pathos uh, infused moment of his speech? We laugh, Bergson goes on because our attention is suddenly recalled from the soul to the body. However, this recall presupposes the opposite movement, whereby rejuvenated by the comic moment, our attention returns to the moral dimension of life with greater zeal. Perhaps in this return and in a humorous atmosphere, we may notice that the speech, which was interrupted by a sneeze, was all too highfalutin. Alternatively, we may wonder about the reasons why pathos-infused speeches do not usually produce laughter, and through this reflection, which liberates us from the enthralling rhetoric, we may find ourselves in a better position to assess the intrinsic value of that speech. There are certain moral views and emotional states that are expected of us. On the one hand, it would be unspeakably callous to discount, for example, the sacrifices of firefighters or those working in the medical field. However, on the other hand, this generally desirable moral attitude and the empathy that underlies it are often exploited for the sake of manipulating public opinion on divisive political issues. It is precisely this kind of manipulation that a sense of humor an aesthetic dimension of ethical sensibility helps us circumvent. A certain lighthearted attitude to life, and here I do not mean to say easygoing or cursory, brings closer to the brink of consciousness, life's dream like nature. A comedic sensibility allows one to stand apart from the ingrained conditioned responses to emotionally charged situations. Comedic sensibility breaks with the prescribed and expected views that do not so much see to the matter at hand as categorize impressions according to the established norms of social interactions. Bruxon explains that the laughable element consists of a certain mechanical inelasticity, just where one would expect to find, this is still Bruxon, the wide awake adaptability and the living pliableness of a human being. There we find, according to Bergson, this mechanical inelasticity, which of course makes for the laughable element, he says. Comedy shines the light on individual attitudes and larger structures that have grown too rigid for their own good, be these structures political, social, moral, organizational, and so on. Comedy points to the rigidity, makes it impossible not to notice this tardiness of thought and thereby creates a possibility of doing away with the retrograde elements in our societies and in ourselves. Comedic sensibility then, or put simply a sense of humor, point the way toward self-knowledge and toward a thoughtful, as opposed to a conditioned response to challenging situations. Moreover, and I see a great value of humor in this, comedy does not proceed doctrinally, systematically or didactically, Quite on the contrary, it throws a wrench into the well-established and accepted order. Comedic playfulness in its capacity to destabilize our view of the world also exposes the outmoded, problematic, no longer viable, and even corrupt political and social arrangements and persons. 
Moreover, humor often serves as a testing ground for political liberty. In non-democratic states or countries where governments only profess to rule democratically, but in fact exercise authoritarian, despotic, totalitarian, and other forms of rule that drastically limit individual freedoms, comedy, especially as a form of political critique, is rarely tolerated. One reason for this is that the power of comedic humor and comedy as an art form reverse the habitual order of things including the common view of the political authority. Mikhail Bakhtin, in his Rabelais and his world, examines this reversal at length while tracing out the history and the social dynamic of carnival laughter and humor. Bakhtin's thoroughgoing interest in the phenomenon of laughter extends to its philosophical and truth value. Bakhtin argues, quotation from Bakhtin, Bakhtin argues that laughter has a deeply contemplative function. It is one of the most substantial forms of truth about the world as a whole, about its history and about human nature. Laughter offers a uniquely universal perspective on the world, and this is still Bakhtin, and sees it differently. But for that matter, humor does not see the world any less meaningfully, perhaps even more so than seriousness. That is why laughter is just as acceptable in great literature, the kind that formulates universally pertinent problems, as a seriousness. A little bit more, uh, a bit more from Bakhtin. Moreover, certain substantial elements of life can only be illuminated by laughter, says Bakhtin, and I'm drawing to a close. Thus, humor's power is two pronged. It is directed at the society and at the individual self exposing the ridiculous within both and thereby opening the possibility of inquiring after the reasons why something presents itself as such, namely as lawfully. It is this last step of reflective questioning that does not necessarily come about of its own accord, and here I see a task for the humanities. This task can be formulated as follows. To cultivate a love of humor and to encourage a pursuit of inquiry about the reasons why we find things laughable. These tasks go into a formation of an ethical and aesthetic sensibility that opens one's mind to the unprescribed arrangements of the world and to the uncharted sightings of one's own character. There simply is no such precept which makes it imperative to nothing say autonomy in any other field of study but the humanities. The search for the meaning of being human which with every human is her responsibility, and thus must begin with herself, is not an end of biotechnologies nor of theoretical science. It stands within the periphery of cosmological disciplines, such as exobiology, for instance, because to search for life outside of Earth is necessarily to reflect on the nature and meaning of earthly living beings, including humankind. However, the disciplines that pose the question of self-knowledge and the meaning of human life sharply as the name says, are the humanities. Mill's view of the task of higher learning likewise articulates the importance of a careful study of the classical heritage, including the study of ancient Greek and Latin languages. Mill also establishes a relationship between one's aptness at making enlightened political decisions and one's knowledge of oneself. For Mill, Government and civil society are the most complicated of all subjects accessible to the human mind. Still from Mill, and he who would deal competently with them as a thinker and not as a blind follower of a party requires not only a general knowledge of the leading facts of life, both moral and material, but an understanding exercised and disciplined in the principles and rules of sound thinking up to a point which neither the experience of life nor any one science or brand, bra, uh, branch of knowledge affords. Let us understand then, Mill still continues, that it should be our aim in learning, not merely to know the one thing which is to be our principal occupation, as well as it can be known, but to do this and also to know something of all the great subjects of human interest, taking care to know that something accurately still mill, marking well the dividing line between what we know accurately and what we do not. 
This last point, you see, the ability to tell the difference between the things one knows and those one doesn't, and willingness to claim, not to claim, not to claim expertise regarding those things which one does not know. This point is Socrates' description of his own wisdom in the Apology. A certain kind of self-knowledge, namely an ability to distinguish the areas in which one is and is not proficient, according to Mill, now I quote, should be our aim in learning. And I had a conclusion, but I will see the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, we'll get a chance to uh, discuss your presentation after we finish uh, the other three. Uh, next is uh, Professor Derek uh, Duplessis, currently of Clemson University. Um, That's right. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, um, Zarko and, and Stuart for organizing this. And it's great to see some familiar faces and some unfamiliar ones too. So I'm gonna just jump right into it. Okay. In the quarrel between philosophy and poetry, we have a well-documented critique of Socratic philosophy from the standpoint of poetry. Plato's dialogues respond to that critique by emphasizing Socrates' political prudence and knowledge of soul. His Socrates at the same time launches an independent counterattack that somewhat speciously reduces poetry to its pedagogic function, and on that basis finds it lacking. While both Aristophanes and Plato might be said to impugn their opponents in part by distorting the character of their respective activities and outlooks, Plato goes somewhat further than the poets in offering an explicit account of the activity in which he is engaged and therewith a defense of philosophy. But on the other end of the dispute, we might ask, where if anywhere might we look um, if we are to reconstruct poetry self-defense. Such a self-defense would seem to require or perhaps be identical to an account of poetry self-understanding. This paper will venture an account of poetry self-understanding by looking at the Bacchae by Euripides. I suggest this particular play is especially relevant to our question insofar as it is what we may call a meta poem. That is, the Bacchae is a tragedy about tragedy. Through its presentation of Dionysus, the god of tragic theater, among other things, we will venture an account of the poet's understanding of tragedy and in particular, its relation to the city. The plot of the Bacchae centers around Dionysus' attempt to establish a cult in his hometown Thebes, whose citizens are hesitant to acknowledge Dionysus' divinity. Their stubborn resistance stems in part from the general principle that, to quote the Bible, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. More importantly, of course, early in the play, we learn of a long-standing controversy surrounding Dionysus' ancestry. The chorus, composed of Dionysus' initiates, attests that Dionysus is the offspring of Zeus and his human mother, Semele, who, um, who, while pregnant, was struck by Zeus's lightning in the midst of her attempt to confirm his identity, her attempt to steal a glimpse of the god's face. According to legend, and as Dionysus insists, Zeus rescued his son from his lightning bolt by stitching him away in his thigh. The Thebans, to the contrary, hold Semele to be a heretic who lied about having been impregnated by Zeus and consequently was vanquished by Zeus's lightning blast for her hubris. The Thebans' questioning of Dionysus' divinity originates out of his mother's own doubts as to the divinity of the man who claimed to be Zeus in human guise. Of course, the confirmation of her hopes takes the shape of her own destruction. The difficulty surrounding the, the human attempt to recognize gods appears therefore to be the issue that inspires the action of the play. It will also turn out to be a central theme of the play. To add a further complication, Dionysus' journey to clear up the controversy, to once and for all establish his divinity in Thebes, is also a journey to root out and punish disbelievers. But while the establishment of his cult requires that he make himself known, the testing of disbelievers apparently requires self-concealment. Dionysus therefore comes to Thebes, Thebes incognito, attempting to establish a cult and to punish those who are incapable of seeing through a disguise designed not to be seen through. At the very outset then, we are confronted with an obvious question. Can human beings be justly punished for failing to see clearly what is not intended to be clearly seen? Early on, Dionysus announces that the first phase of his, Theban, of his Theban offensive is already underway. In order to vindicate his mother, Dionysus bewitches the women of Thebes who retreat to a mountain pasture. 
Dionysus is bewitchment of the female half of Thebes is somewhat ambiguously related to his desire that Thebes learn its lesson. Is the mania of the women intended by Dionysus to be a sign for the male half? Is the mania of the women an obstacle to or a condition for their own possible embrace of Dionysus' divinity? Or to put the question differently, what finally is the difference between being under the spell of Dionysus, being a worshiper of Dionysus, and being punished by Dionysus? If the curse on the women is intended to prove to the Thebans, and especially Pentheus, king of Thebes, that a god is among them, it appears to be unsuccessful. Pentheus suspends his travels abroad and returns home after hearing, quote, stories of our women leaving home to frisk and mock ecstasies among the thickets on the mountain, dancing in honor of the latest divinity, a certain Dionysus, whoever he may be, end quote. Although the women claim to be, um, although the women claim to be newly initiated priestesses of Bacchus, Pentheus supposes, quote, it's really Aphrodite they adore, end quote. Pentheus recognizes that some effeminate stranger is the proximate cause for whatever enthusiasm swept the women of Thebes, including his own mother. And yet he misunderstands the nature of both the cause and the effect. Although the misbehavior of the Theban women, women explicable as it is on Aphrodisian grounds, fails to provide, provide incontrovertible evidence for Dionysus' divinity, the remainder of the play showcases a series of Dionysian signs and wonders, to list a few. Pentheus arrests the women, but they are mysteriously released. Pentheus attempts to arrest the effeminate stranger as Dionysus, and yet his, effort, his efforts to, uh, here too are frustrated. In a scene that illustrates both Dionysus' divine power and the profound challenge of recognizing a god, Pentheus detains the stranger and deposits him in a stable beside the palace. Pentheus attempts to bind the stranger, but returns to find a bull tied up instead. The stranger quietly looks on as Pentheus struggles. Dionysius shakes the palace. Dionysus creates an illusion that the palace is on fire. Pentheus scrambles to extinguish it. Dionysus creates a phantom resembling the stranger who Pentheus believes to have escaped. He attempts unsuccessfully to stab the phantom, but stabs only air. Finally, Dionysus causes the palace to crumble. This short passage contains an enormous amount of action, and yet that action is almost entirely opaque. Dionysus appears in so many guises that it's nearly impossible to identify where Dionysus actually is. The difficulty in, in identifying where Dionysus is is related to the ambiguity concerning what, generally speaking, Dionysus does. In the midst of his stern warning to Pentheus, Tiresias the seer rattles off a list of Dionysus's powers. Dionysus is the inventor of wine. Through Dionysus, man, mankind forgets its grief. Dionysus brings sleep. By pouring libations, Dionysus makes it possible for mankind to win the favor of heaven. He intercedes on our behalf. He stands as, as an emissary from humans to gods. Dionysus bestows powers of prophecy. Finally, Dionysus, we are told, usurps the warlike function of Ares by striking armies with panic. In some, he helps us forget and he gives us sight. He helps us calm down and he inspires blinding panic. Through all of this, he somehow assists mankind in its quest to win the favor of heaven. He connects us to the gods. Tiresias also uses this occasion to correct a misconception about Dionysus, about Dionysus' birth. Although it is held by some that Dionysus was stitched away in Zeus's thigh, this story, according to Tiresias, is premised on a misunderstanding. The true story goes like this. After impregnating Semele, Zeus rescued Dionysus from the lightning bolt, but then had to conceal and protect him from Hera's jealous rage. He did so by fashioning a dummy Dionysus, who he gave away as a hostage in order to save the real Dionysus. Dionysus wasn't saved in Zeus's thigh, um, Omeros in Greek. He was, saved, he was saved by Zeus's hostage, Homeros in Greek. Uh, it's a pun, obviously. Dionysus's false origin story is thus the consequence of the incapacity to understand the one sound can yield two meanings. It owes to a failure on the part of some human beings to see double. But as is clear from Tiresias' from Tiresias's description of Dionysus' various powers above, it is precisely Dionysus who bestows a double vision of the world. He does so in the following ways. He once again mollifies our anxieties by enabling us to become blind to what is. He stimulates panic by awakening us to, um, to what seems to be but is not. His wine induces a blinding double vision. And as we shall see, his theater produces a clarifying double vision. Really quick, the pun, Homeros has another part to it. I mean, Homeros is obviously Homer too, so 
Tiresias is gesturing toward the role of Homer, the poets in, uh, in image making and God creation. Okay, already dispirited from, from the strangers that is Dionysus' miraculous escape from the stable, Pentheus, still un unwilling to concede Dionysus' divinity, receives unwanted news. A messenger comes forward bringing word of the Bacchantus, and in particular word of, quote, weird, fantastic things, what miracles and more than miracles these women do. Unquote. At the break of day from a mountain ridge, the messenger and his fellow herdsmen spotted the Theban women frolicking in a pasture the women, apparently sober, are seen awakening from a soft slumber, uh, breasts swollen with milk, new mothers had, who had left their babies behind at home, nestled gazelles and young wolves in their arms, suckling them. A herdsman proposes a mission to extricate Agave, uh, Pentheus's mother, from the group so as to win favor with King Pentheus. The plan, when put into action, backfires and unleashes the fury of the women who proceed to dismember the herd of cattle, pillage uh, neighboring villages, kidnap children, miraculously elude the spheres of men, and inflict wounds on their, uh, with their wands. Although Dionysus' enchantment connects the women to the divine by conferring upon them godlike powers, it does so at the same time as it dissolves the natural boundaries between humans and beasts. The women under the spell of Dionysus and released from the constraints of the law are either gods or beasts, but surely not human. The messenger's report is sufficient to move Pentheus at long last, to propose a sacrifice to Dionysus. The stranger in response suggests that this will be insufficient and that Pentheus too will be dismembered if he even attempts. The stranger instead invites Pentheus to come out to the mountainside and spy a glimpse of the women himself. Perhaps surprisingly, he responds enthusiastically, quote, I would pay a great sum to see that sight, end quote. Perhaps unsurprisingly, he follows up this declaration of interest adding, quote, of course, I'd be sorry to see them drunk. <laughs> the stranger thus seduces Pentheus with the prospect of viewing the women engaged in the very miscon misconduct he had blamed the stranger for inspiring in the first place. Pentheus, guided by an actor, is now off to sit in a hollow cut from the sheer of the cliffs to take pleasure in the painful spectacle of women in the intoxic under the intoxication of Dionysus. Pentheus is off to the theater. But in order for Pentheus to be a spectator, he must also become a performer. As Dionysus insists, Pentheus must disguise himself as a woman so that, as a woman so that he may evade the wrath of the Bacchantus. In spite of his initial resistance to this indignity, it is after all beneath King Pentheus, the holy public man, to don any disguise, not to mention that of a woman. His intense desire to see the women in action causes him ultimately to acquiesce. Immediately following a choral break in which the worshipers of Dionysus declare, quote, the gods are crafty. They lie in ambush a long step of time to hunt the unholy. Pentheus emerges transformed in both appearance and disposition. For the first time, Pentheus seems to have come under the spell of Dionysus. He confesses a renewed vision of the world. He says, I seem to see two suns blazing in the heaven and now two Thebes, two cities and each with seven gates and you are a bull who walks before me there." End quote. His ability to, for the first time, partially see the stranger's disguise is concomitant with his newly acquired Dionysian double vision of the world. Another sign of Pentheus's transformation is his new willingness, not to say determination, to be seen performing his mission. Whereas Pentheus's shame at appearing as a woman had initially motivated his determination to take the back roads to Scytheron, he now declares his um, desire to be led through the very heart of Thebes, since, as he now boasts, I alone of, the, uh, of all the city dare to go. Both Pentheus' prurient desire to revel in the spectacle of the shameful, Bacchantus, and his desire to be seen doing so, stand in an uneasy relation to his initial sententious opposition to the Bacchantus and squeamishness at the disguise he would have to don in order to survive the mission. This reversal, whatever its precise cause, indicates some contradiction within his desire for honor. Pentheus moves from a proud conviction that some things are beneath him, seemingly to the proud conviction that it would be beneath him uh, to think that anything is beneath him. The result is that he now believes he shouldn't be honored for his, the result is that he now believes he should be honored for his willingness and ability to act shamefully. The desire to be honored as a custodian of political order now takes the shape of a desire to be honored for his total freedom from political order. What is revealed at bottom is, his, is the desire for total autonomy that underlies his pretense to, to civic service and public morality. 
Dionysus somehow exploits the contradiction in Pentheus's Thumos and uses that contradiction to, to convert Pentheus away from politics and initiate him into his mysteries. Full Dionysian possession, paradoxically, slakes the tyrant's desire for autonomy more directly than political mastery can. The political passions Pentheus, uh, sorry, the political passions Pentheus's conversion helps us to see contain the kernel of their own destruction. Indeed, the political consequences of Dionysus's intervention in Thebes are on vivid display in the final episodes of the play. Pentheus's conversion and his triumphant departure for Cithaeron are followed up by a break in which the chorus once again steps forth to deliver an address. This ode, unlike all of the previous, foregrounds the issue of justice and law for the first time. Their refrain is as follows. O oh, justice, principle of order, spirit of custom, come, be manifest, reveal yourself with a sword. Stab through the throat that godless man, the mocker who goes, flouting custom and outraging God, referring to Pentheus. Pentheus is repeatedly declared to be not only unjust, but godless and lawless, godless and lawless in addition. The accusation of injustice and lawlessness strikes the ear as odd in a play that seems to uh, place Dionysianism in nomos on a collision course. Even if Pentheus has acted unjustly toward Dionysus through his willful refusal to acknowledge his divinity, has he also in doing so acted contrary to law or custom? Lawless, of course, perhaps better describes Pentheus's condition following his conversion. It is a direct consequence of his submission to Dionysus. The worshipers of Dionysus now blame Pentheus for failing to live up to his own former standard of conduct. Apparently, one cannot be just toward Dionysus and be just or lawful simply, simultaneously. Pentheus is also to be punished for failing to meet three criteria of conduct, godliness, lawfulness, and justice, that cannot be blended, at least not when the god in question is Dionysus. The course's invocation of justice amounts to a celebration of the manifest injustice of punishing Pentheus and, as we shall see, Thebes, in general, for what appears to be a forced error. The justice called for by the chorus ultimately takes the form of regicide. The audience learns of Pentheus' death and dismemberment from a messenger who reports the gruesome details back in Thebes. Pentheus, dissatisfied with his seat, this is the report. Pentheus, dissatisfied with his seat, quote, in a hollow cut from the sheer rock of the cliffs, attempts to gain a better view from atop a fir tree. In doing so, Pentheus breaches the fourth wall and makes himself seen by the Bacchantus. A great voice out of heaven exhorts the Bacchantus to take ven vengeance on, upon Pentheus for his blasphemy. Pentheus in the end is killed by his mother who mistakes him for a lion. Although it looked as if Dionysus's exhortation um, was responsible for the assault against Pentheus, it turns out that Agave acts, or Agave acts on the basis of a feverish misunderstanding. Uh, this misunderstanding perhaps stands for the state of mind characteristic of Dionysian intoxication more generally. Can, human, uh, can humans ever really knowingly obey God? They have to be drunk or, or deluded to even hear. By breaching the line between audience and stage, Pentheus goes from being a spectator of tragedy to an actor in a tragedy, and finally the object of tragedy. Pentheus' journey from the polis to the theater to the stage is the poetic image of his conversion away from politics and his initiation into the Dionysian religion. Although Pentheus' fate is attributed to his impiety, it is his full submission to Dionysus that ultimately, ultimately leads to his destruction. But to emphasize Pentheus's fate is to forget that Dionysus's actions are intended to punish Thebes as a whole. King Pentheus is killed. The women of Thebes are cursed. Agave is banished. Most strikingly, even Cadmus, the founder of Thebes, who had early on counseled Pentheus to recognize Dionysus' divinity, if only on pragmatic grounds, is, tran is transformed into a serpent and driven out of Thebes. Um, in his final address, Cadmus laments, quote, now I must go, a banished and dishonored man. I, Cadmus the Great, who sowed the soldiery of Thebes and harvested a great harvest. In his lamentation, Cadmus reminds us of the mythical um, octophonous origins of Thebes. He thereby points toward what is perhaps the original and most critical error of Thebes, the error for which it must be punished. It is not just that Thebes is culpable for its failure to acknowledge that Dionysus is Zeus born, Thebes prides itself on its wholly natural origins. But a city that pretends to be wholly natural, that collapses the natural and the conventional, 
ultimately sacrifices the natural to the conventional. In founding Thebes, Cadmus attempts to construct a closed cave. Such a city has no place for a god that seems to stand for a sphere of human experience that is fundamentally antinomian, one which would threaten to smuggle natural light into that closed system. Dionysus punishes Thebes for its hubristic attempt to absolutize the political at the exclusion of the aspects of life that necessarily elude or transcend the political. I'm almost done, by the way. Does Dionysus and therewith Dionysian poetry therefore stand for the natural? Perhaps, although one must remember that Dionysus is also the god of illusion, which would seem to ally him with the poets who manufacture images within the cave. Perhaps we may conclude at least this much. The Bacchae reminds us of the aspects of poetry, which cannot be yoked by the city for its purposes. This non-political poetry, of course, can have positive political effects. It alerts us to parts of our nature that can't be satisfied by politics. It therefore provides a perspective from which we might step beyond the city to see the city as it is and ourselves as we are. Tragedy provides an escape from the city in much the same way as the drinking parties described in Plato's laws provide an escape from the law. Just as the would-be lawgiver must study souls as they appear when the shackles of the law are temporarily dissolved, tragedy presents a closed cave from the outside and in doing so provides an occasion for a spectator to stand back and reflect on human nature from a perspective beyond the closed cave. It thus makes us aware of nature, even if it does not give an account of it. Of course, part of the tragedy of the Bacchae is that, th is that the Thebans seem to be denied a standpoint from which they might step beyond the city and gain access to a vision beyond it. Pentheus is only granted a glimpse of what humans are like when unfettered from the law at the very moment in which he's too much under Dionysus' spell to see things clearly. In the Bacchae, one is either entirely blind to Dionysus' powers or fully given over to them. Euripides, unlike his Dionysus, does make available a perspective from which the Dionysian and the political dimensions of life can be viewed from the outside. In the end, it is Euripides, not Dionysus, who bestows double vision. Euripides then is not entirely identifiable with his Dionysus, and tragedy is perhaps not tragic, even if its stories are. Really almost done one more, a few more lines. But we must return to the question with which this essay and indeed play begins. It was early suggested that a chief theme of the Bacchae is the difficulty of recognizing a god. If this is so, what does the latter have to do with the play's thematization of dramatic poetry and its powers? A suggestion. Dionysus stands for the gods, but he also stands, I suggest, for poetry. Dionysus is presented by Tiresias as the link between humans and gods, and it is poetry that seems to, at least in part, provide that link. Dionysus is the one god for whom, whom humans can look upon directly without being destroyed because he is, by his very nature, concealed. The tragedy of Dionysus, the god of illusion, is that he cannot be recognized as he is without becoming other than he is. But this is perhaps from the standpoint of poetry, essentially related to the problem of understanding poetry as it is. Poets who are responsible for generating myths about the gods, Homeros, cannot be recognized for their unique powers without exposing themselves and diminishing those powers. Euripides, whose religious heterodoxy was well known to his audience, seems to have a dual purpose in these final moments of his career. By seeming to endorse the power of the divine, he is attempting also to revive the primordial power of poetry and human life, while at the same time constructing a drama designed to be instructive to those who are capable of seeing the poets and the gods in their double aspect. Poetry is and is not home in the cave because the gods of the poets do and do not support the city. Thank you very much. Great, we'll um, hear from Dr. Lemanowski next. Independent scholar? Independent-minded scholar? <laughs> we'll see. Um, thank you, Zarko. Um, so uh, it's my custom to show up annually to a meeting like this and say some heinous things about Lucretius. So, um, and a few of you know that, um, but since this is a public forum, um, I will briefly explain my method and interest when reading Lucretius. Um, there are numerous moments in the end give some context here for those of you who haven't read it. Roman poet, um, turn of the millennium a few ago, um, 
90 something BC. Materialist poem seems to be Epicurean. This is the question. There are numerous moments in this poem where the otherwise straightforward Epicurean exposition is interrupted by examples that do not quite fit the context, images that give us more than we expected and digressions on apparently unrelated topics. After writing my dissertation on those moments that seemed instructive to the reader on how to approach the poem, I came to a fundamental question about the poet's intentions, particularly with regard to two things, Epicureanism and philosophy. It is the poem itself that suggests that we can separate these two. And it does this in part by offering moments in the Epicurean argument that seem to be applicable metaphorically, describing not materialism, but the human things. With only a few minutes today, I will not rebuild this thesis, but I will try to focus on a few curious items in book four uh, to try to tease this out further. Let me first posit a simple claim. Whereas Epicurean science is the poetic foreground of the poem, philosophizing is the invisible force behind the poem, which drives the poet, but is only an ambiguous part of his recommendations for the reader. Perhaps this is obvious to some degree. Lucretius himself tells us that Epicurus already traveled beyond the walls of the world and brought back knowledge of the nature of things. The poet simply follows, tries to imitate weakly, feeds like a bee in a field upon the father's golden words, and is taken by pleasure and horror in the face of his teaching. The philosophizing was done by Epicurus and the results are ours to enjoy. So the only thing left for Lucretius is to uh, spread the good, the good news. Thus, we have the famous image of the poet touching the Epicurean reasoning, which has seemed bitter to many with the quote, sweet honey of the muses, which is to say poetry, just as a doctor would put honey on the lip of a cup containing a bitter medicine to trick a sick child into drinking it. This image is probably the most famous part of the poem because it is taken as the final statement on the poet's intention. Let's see if we can complicate this. <clears throat> when discussing the senses in book four, Lucretius explains how flavors are tasted, why some food is nourishing to one but poisonous to another, and why sickness changes the way things taste. The answer, our mouth squeezes out some part of the food that we chew and these particles pass through the quote, twisted passageways of the loose knit tongue. Some of these particles are smooth, some of these are rough, and the shape of the passageways determines which particles fit through them. Smooth particles taste good to us, sharp particles are harsh and bitter. Sickness can alter what he calls the arrangement of the first beginnings, that is the shape of these passageways, so that the particles that passed into your passageways before now cannot get in and other particles can. This short section ends suddenly in the claim that quote, both sorts of seeds, smooth and rough, are mixed together in the flavor of honey. This, he goes on to say, we have already often demonstrated to you before. This is bizarre, because <laughs> he gave honey and the initial uh, use of it as sweet. That's its purpose. It might be simple to suggest that if we applied this to the poetic statement above, it shows that our tastes change and that our sick children might find the bitter Epicurean reasoning to be sweet once they are cured. But the poet does not assert that this duality, uh, this, sorry, that this dual quality belongs to wormwood. Uh, it's the honey, it's the sweet thing that Lucretius gives us that apparently can be tasted in two different ways, depending on our internal situation. If taken metaphorically, this might mean that a rejection of the poetry or of the poem itself awaits us within, if something within us changes. Historically, scholars have found an existential paradox in the fact of an Epicurean poem since Epicurus himself rejected and certainly did not write poetry. Perhaps this would be solved by the metaphorical application of this strange claim about honey, which would indicate that the poem is somehow self-destructing. Read Lucretius, learn to love Epicurus instead, and throw away the verses of the student in favor of the simple sayings of the master. But Lucretius describes his work in other ways besides that found in the famous image of sweet honey and bitter medicine. Most significantly, he gives a twofold vision of his work in an unexpected digression during a discussion of the concept of void in book one. Void is a crucial concept. Um, there he says, on the one hand, that he has, quote, scraped together trust over the course of many arguments, amounting only to what he calls little traces that the reader, like a hunting dog, can distinguish and follow. Traces is vestigia or footprints. But if the reader should, quote, show hesitation or turn aside a little from your task, 
such large drafts from deep fountains the poet's sweet tongue will pour out of his well-stocked mind. More arguments than can be heard in a lifetime. So the poetry contains a liquid pleasure and a faint scent, apparently within one and the same text, and apparently for two unique types of readers. Perhaps this is the basis on which to divide the two tastes of honey, one that's carried away by sweetness and one not. And as it happens in the section of book four, immediately following the discourse on flavor that we just covered, the poet treats scent using some familiar animal examples. Bees are attracted to honey. Vultures are attracted to dead bodies. And quote, where the cloven foot of beasts has stepped, go the dogs. We ourselves are attracted to this passage since it reminds us of Lucretius's over the top praise of Epicurus at the beginning of book three, which we quickly summarized at the beginning of this paper. Just as bees drink from flowers in the meadow, so we, Lucretius Epicureans, feed on the golden words of Epicurus. Honey is the poetic charm of Lucretius in book one. It is that to which bees are drawn in book four, and bees are the image of Epicureans in book three. One could and should give a closer analysis of the use of animals throughout the poem because their comparison with human types seems to be particularly important for understanding its political dynamics. <clears throat> but for now, we can say that bees only occur twice in the poem and are associated once with honey and their primary comparison is to a philosophic type, that is a philosophic believer. And here they appear beside another philosophic type, the hunting dog, that is the attentive reader. It may be significant that dogs do not appear in the section on taste. We don't hear about what dogs eat. They certainly do eat. Um, Lucretius tells us uh, when discussing smell that different creatures smell different things. And this is good because it leads them towards their food and away from poison. This is sort of its function, right, naturally. But while bees smell honey and vultures smell corpses, dogs smell footprints. Westigia, same word from before. And where honey was the sudden final line of the section on taste, this section ends with an argument that smells are not easy to locate. And with an equally sudden line, we bring the dogs in for the second time. Quote, thus dogs often wander and seek footprints, says the poet. We may be concerned that these dogs will go hungry because there seems to be a much longer and much more deceptive route to their goal than the bees have to their honey. It also seems significant that this final statement echoes again the introduction of the dog reader metaphor in book one. As mentioned above, Lucretius interrupts a discussion on void to, to explain his two types of writing or his two types of readers. And he begins that section with the promise that understanding void will be useful to you in many matters and will stop readers from wandering, doubting, and seeking, and lacking faith in his words. <clears throat> the discovery of void, the exact place where things are missing, sets off the poet's explanation that he has only scraped together trust and that we the readers should see one thing from another, chase the poet like a wild beast in the mountains, drag back the truth ourselves, and discover the rest on our own. Now, in the section that explains just how to use one's nose, it turns out that dogs, in search of a scent, mostly wander and seek, a thing that we weren't supposed to do. We might have been skeptical in book one that emptiness was supposed to stop us from wandering and looking for something meant to fill it. But now it seems that those behaviors are perhaps desirable or at least characteristic in our metaphorical representatives. It may seem like a stretch to return to this passage on void from the beginning of the poem, but as void is the physical space that makes movement possible, void as a concept sets the rest of the poem in motion. And it is central to the senses that we have been exploring. This is because our bodies are not solid, but rather raris or loose knit as Englert translates it. Um, that, and this is how they have senses. Raris, by the way, this is where we get rare and the sense you might recognize in English that's closer to this is something like rarefied. Um, that's what it means. Um, Raris is the word that Lucretius uses in book one to describe bodies that seem solid, like caves, when justifying that actually they have void in them. And this is where we began today, explaining how taste works. The twisted passageways of the loose-knit tongue, or rara lingua, let in some particles and not others, and can change shape in our lives such that our taste changes. Somehow. Sickness, something else, who knows? So at this point, we can step back and look at the sort of movement of book four where he talks about all of the senses. Of the senses, Lucretius begins at great length with sight, 
arguing the Epicurean line that simulacra or physical likenesses traveled from the objects to our eyes before explaining in his conclusion that, quote, it is preferable lacking reason to give a false account of sight rather than break our primary trust and stop believing in the things that we see. This is, he's just argued for this. And then he says, basically, if it's false, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's better than the alternative. After uh, what a famous commentator calls this curious concession, he moves on to the other senses. But it is this initial hint of a lack of faith that sets us to pay closer attention to what follows and is what makes us wonder if there is some other lesson to be drawn from the arguments, especially the images employed by the poet. In other words, if the arguments are not literally true, perhaps they are figuratively useful. The first of the other senses is hearing, in which sounds wind their way through the passages of houses and other objects to us. That's how void sort of appears there uh, as, the, as the operating thing behind the senses. Depending on our distance from the speaker and other impediments, we hear the sounds more or less faithfully. Significantly, rather than dogs or bees or any other animal, Lucretius makes a grand statement here about the human race. He says, the entire human race is too eager of ears as a result of how we love to boast of wonders or gods that we hear when we are alone in the woods. Uh, commentators disagree on this phrase, eager of ears, but it means either that we are too eager to win the ears of others with our stories or somehow too eager to hear of wonders ourselves. The discussion of sound begins with the assertion that sounds insinuate themselves into the ears and strike the sense organ. And thereafter, uh, the argument is concerned with how sound travels through the world, how it breaks up and stuff like that, rather than how it gets into us. Um, to the extent that we are interested in the disposition of certain creatures towards certain types of stimuli, our oral avidity for rational sense seems to distinguish us as a species. From hearing, we pass on to taste and smell, where we have focused on the dispositions the creatures chose to mention. Um, something maybe prefer preferring this scent to that scent, eating this food and not that food, et cetera. Um, the poet will move next to a long discourse on mental images, like the simulacra of vision, but finer, more tenuous. But just before moving from smell to mental images, the poet gives a brief and bizarre digression on a type of sight-like emission from roosters that only lions are affected by quite negatively. Lions apparently have this highly unpleasant disposition, openness, that they cannot change, which makes them fear and flee roosters. So, so Lucretius says he's getting this from some, you know, uh, ancient uh, animal commentator. Humans are unaffected, says the poet, either because these emissions do not enter us or enter and leave quickly. Only if the seeds were to enter us and stay would they cause us pain as they do for lions. Because it does not cause us pain, we are blind to this phenomenon. And there is no name for this sense because we do not have it. Mental images, and that whole section takes up about 10 lines. Um, mental images, meanwhile, do enter us and stay long enough to cause trouble. These mental images, these very thin pictures of things that are smaller than the pictures of things that we see with our eyes, um, as he says, pass through the pores of the body. The phrase here is rara corporis. The adjective for loose knit now deployed in this phrase as a substantive, meaning the pores themselves. These tenuous shapes uh, that affect our mind come straight into our emptiness, into our loose knit character, almost as if there are no shapes to those passages, no predispositions determining what will fit and what will not. At first, we are told that we cannot control the damage these images do when we are asleep. And thus dreams of monsters or dead people haunt us as they randomly pass through us. But in the act of thinking, we make just as much use of these images. And it turns out that the mind, as he says, cannot see sharply any except those to which it attends. So all which exist beside perish, except those for which the mind has prepared itself. So in other words, we have a whole stock of these images, we focus on some of them and the rest kind of fade away. Um, and it turns out that this same attention can extend into our sleep and determine our dreams. This seems to be a shift from his initial statement on dreams. In dreams, we seem to engage in, quote, whatever pursuit a person is devoted and persistently clings to, and in whatever things we have been engaged before and on which our mind has been more intent. 
This is because, as he says, the paths have still remained open in our minds by which the same images of things are able to enter. Thinking, therefore, seems to happen by a kind of path making. And an extremely rare thing happens at this point. Lucretius describes himself dreaming of seeking the nature of things, finding it, and writing it in Latin. Among the other examples of dreamers, we find hunter's dogs once again, sniffing in their sleep after the footprints of wild beasts. So if, if we were to track the appearance of these various images across book four and the rest of the poem, we might venture some conclusions. We began from a strange assertion about the taste of honey, which seems to complicate unnecessarily the elegant image that defined the poet's intention or defines the poet's intention for most uh, commentators. If honey can lose its charm, then there may be a way in which Lucretius' verses lose their charm. And if, as in the other significant passage on the poet's intent, there is a difference between the sweet surfeit of the poem's arguments and the eager chase of a mere scent of truth, then there may be a way that we can see the poem in both of those modes, or perhaps move from one to the other. If there is, let us venture to say, an ascent from pleasantly satisfied tasting of the immediate to the less pleasant and less immediate smelling of the distant, then it may be necessary that honey ceases to satisfy us. When the poet constantly assures us that we should trust him and that we should not wonder, pouring out argument after potentially contradictory argument in favor of materialism, lest we go mad with fear of the gods, he simultaneously offers materialist images that seem to take on their own shape, as we have tried to show by following the bees and the dogs throughout the poem. There's one last passage that we can lay beside the others that we have given. In the remarkable history of mankind in book five, Lucretius explains that the beginning of religious belief, not in stray images or mysterious sounds this time, but in the mind, is in the mind itself. Um, when, quote, a lack of rational explanation assails our uncertain mind, we turn to gods to explain the perseverance of the order that we depend on in the world. The poet repeats here the same phrase that he gives at the end of the discourse on sight, rationis agestas, the poverty of reason. In that passage, he says it's preferable to accept a false explanation of sight rather than lose what is obviously good and necessary. That is, if we, if we have a poverty of reason, if we can't explain it any other way, we should give a false explanation. Epicureans would say that the stories of the gods are a false explanation for the existence of the world, but that by accepting them, we take on an unnecessary burden. But Lucretius, for some reason, draws the Epicureans themselves parallel with religion by this repetition. Prior to doing so, he empties the bag, arguing for the materialist explanation of sight, just as he promised to do for the reader who turned aside from his task of chasing the truth in the poem. I suggest that applying the arguments that Lucretius goes on to use for taste and smell metaphorically, we can come to see a disposition that would allow us to take a middle position between paralyzing doubt and pacifying acceptance of likely stories. This is the disposition the poet takes so often himself that even when he sleeps, he seeks the nature of things. He does not say of himself that he dreams of Epicurus' words. Lucretius shows us himself philosophizing, which is an activity that creates a disposition or a certain shape of the emptiness in ourselves that behaves as a controlled pursuit of truth. The hunting dogs often go hungry. Great. Thank you for this appetizing paper. Now we're putting on our seven league boots and going all the way to Nietzsche uh, with uh, Dr. Ian Dag, University Thank of Dallas. You. All right. Um, in the ninth aphorism of Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche says the following, but this is an ancient eternal story. What formerly happened with the Stoics still happens today too. As soon as any philosophy begins to believe in itself, it always creates the world in its own image. It cannot do otherwise. Philosophy is this tyrannical drive itself, the most spiritual or intellectual will to power. If philosophy is an expression of the creative power of the philosopher, then this raises a problem surrounding the teaching of will to power. Is will to power a reflection of nature in speech? Or is it Nietzsche's attempt to stamp himself onto nature? to impose his own will onto nature. And in this sense, is Nietzsche subject to the criticism that he makes of the Stoics of wanting to impose his own understanding, his own standard of morality onto nature? And if the will to power teaching is the latter, then does the teaching necessarily undercut itself and lead to its own self-destruction or not? 
There's a second problem associated with the will to power teaching as it is presented in Beyond Good and Evil. Will to power is used as a description in the first chapter, not only to describe the most intellectual expression of the human mind, philosophy, but also the human mind in general, life itself, and even physics. The attempt to explain everything in terms of will to power puts considerable stress on the teachings intelligibility and explanatory power. If everything is an expression of will to power, then it's hard to see what exactly is explained by will to power or how it could give rise to the differentiation that we experience daily. Finally, a third problem is that the term is used in an equivocal fashion. Sometimes it seems to explain everything as the combination of usages in the first chapter implies, while at other times it is used as a quality of which one may have or be lacking. For example, if it is to thrive, a living body will have to be an incarnate will to power that will strive to grow, spread, seize, become predominant, not from any morality or immorality, but because it is living and because life simply is will to power. Nietzsche calls the refusal to injure, commit violence, or exploit in the name of equality on the part of Democrats, a will to the denial of life, that is a will to the den denial of the will to power. Nietzsche could have described the situation of anti-aristocratic Europe as an expression of the will to power of a weaker sort of man. This would have been in tune with a holistic understanding of will to power. Instead, he describes such people as denying the will to power, as being in need of education in what life or will to power is. Nietzsche seems to make the mistake he accuses the Stoics of making in the first usage of will to power that of declaring what is according to nature and then demanding that people live accordingly. But as he says, why make a principle of what is? How could one not live according to nature, that is, according to the will to power? That there is a rhetorical aspect to will to power is undeniable, but to what extent is it rhetorical? To return to the first problem, that the will to power teaching undercuts or seems to undercut itself, Nietzsche is so far from failing to see that this is a problem that he draws attention to it as a problem. In the aphorism in which he attributes will to power to physics, not only does he place will to power in quotations, but he also directly addresses the reader who makes the objection that this too is only interpretation with encouragement. Well, so much the better. This is commonly taken to mean that Nietzsche thinks the will to power teaching can withstand such an objection and perhaps that even making the objection is to begin to be won over to the teaching. But it could also mean that the will to power teaching serves as a kind of test that the better readers will be reluctant to accept or not accept. If refusal to accept the will to power teaching is made on the basis of a delight in one's own creative powers, then to deny the teaching on this basis is nevertheless to deny it from within the confines of the teaching. However, perhaps a different type of person could deny the teaching on reasonable grounds. And it's possible that Nietzsche says so much the better to both types of readers. If the first chapter, if in the first chapter, Nietzsche presents will to power as a dogmatism that he encourages the reader to object to, so in the second chapter, he presents it as a hypothesis. They're encouraging the reader to consider the second problem I began with, namely that it is hard to see how a single principle could explain multiplicity. Suppose finally we succeeded in explaining our entire instinctive life as the development and ramification of one basic form of the will, namely of the will to power as my proposition has it. Suppose all organic functions could be traced back to this will to power and one could also find in it the solution of the problem of procreation and nourishment. It is one problem. Then one would have gained the right to determine all efficient force univocally as will to power. The world viewed from inside the world defined and determined according to its intelligible character, it would be will to power, and here will to powers in quotations, and nothing else. Now, do we have access to the world viewed from the inside? Or is such a position, a bird's eye view without perspective, one that we need to reject? Nietzsche himself provides evidence that we ought to reject his experiment as a failure. In the same aphorism, he says that the moral method demanded by the day requires us not to assume several kinds of causality until the experiment of making do with a single one has been pushed to its utmost limit, to the point of nonsense, if I may say so. To make will to power serve as a unifying causal principle comes to sight as pushing the teaching to the point of nonsense. If this interpretation is correct, then Nietzsche cannot be serious about will to power as a causal explanation. However, his next usage does seem to employ it in this manner. 
the saint as one who combines strong and weak wills is for this reason an interesting test case to explore the will to power's capacity as a causal explanation. Nietzsche states that the powerful of the world learned a new fear before the saint. They sensed a new power, a strange as yet unconquered enemy. It was the will to power that made them stop before the saint. Nietzsche places will to power in quotations here too, as he had when attributing the doctrine to physics in general. How can the singular will to power serve as the same explanation for both the strongest and the saint? Or to put this differently, if will to power is to serve as the causal explanation, then what is said of the saint could be said of any other type whatsoever. And the problematic quality of the concept as a causal explanation might explain why Nietzsche places it in quotations when using it to describe the saint. If the will to power teaching fails to serve as a genuine causal explanation, and Nietzsche's placement of the doctrine in quotations indicates that he is beginning to distance himself from it as a causal explanation, then we can expect him to abandon or clearly modify the term. However, if it serves a rhetorical or pedagogical purpose in its position as a causal explanation, then we might not expect him to do so in any obvious manner. In point of fact, Nietzsche's next usage is one of the most uncompromising affirmations of will to power used as a causal explanation in the work. Whoever has felt deeply how insipidly false and sentimental this principle is, that of hurting no one and helping as much as you can, in a world whose essence is will to power, may allow himself to be reminded that Schopenhauer, though a pessimist, really played the flute. So what is the status of this feeling? What has justified Nietzsche's shift from treating the causal explanation as a hypothetical experiment to a confirmed fact? Or if Nietzschean claims about the essence of the world strike one as over the top, then one might wonder. One might wonder if Nietzsche himself isn't playing the flute. But if he is, then can this be shown? Nietzsche begins the subsequent aphorism in the following way. Even apart from the value of such claims as there is a categorical imperative in us, one can still always ask, what does such a claim tell us about the man who makes it? While clearly referring to Kant, Nietzsche surely expects us to turn his own method on him and wonder about the relationship between Nietzsche and his own doctrine. The next aphorism tells us, every morality is as opposed to laissez-laissez or letting go, a bit of tyranny against nature, also against reason. But this in itself is no objection, as long as we do not have some other morality which permits us to decree that every kind of tyranny and unreason is impermissible. Given the context, we should observe that will to power is a moral interpretation and that Nietzsche effectively acknowledges that it is a kind of uh, tyranny over nature. And his usage of nature uh, that I just mentioned here um, is placed in quotations. And he places nature in quotations the next two times he refers to it in this aphorism as well. However, the last reference to nature still within the same aphorism is an exception, not placing quotations. You shall obey someone and for a long time, else you will perish and lose respect for yourself. This appears to be the moral imperative of nature, which to be sure is neither categorical as the old Kant would have it, hence the else, nor addressed to the individual. What do individuals matter to her? but to peoples, races, ages, classes, above all, to the whole human animal, to man. Nietzsche transitions from potentially playfully considering will to power to be the essence of the world, and by doing so, treating any conception of nature as a manifestation of will to power, and therefore to be placed in quotations, to a description of nature made in his own name without qualification. And the next usage of will to power is used as a means of distinction. All these moralities that address themselves to the individual for the sake of his happiness, as one says, what are they but counsels for behavior in relation to the degree of dangerousness in which the individual lives with himself, recipes against his passions, his good and bad inclinations, insofar as they have the will to power and want to play the master, little and great prudences and artifices that exude the nook odor of old nostrums and of the wisdom of old women, all of them baroque and unreasonable in form, because they address themselves to all, because they generalize where one must not generalize. Does Nietzsche's experiment with will to power count as such a generalization? Here, by treating will to power in a qualified fashion, he seems to acknowledge that the robust causal interpretation does count as such a generalization. The next usage brings the problem to a head. The sole usage in the chapter, we scholars, 
states that the philosopher's task demands that he creates values, create values. That is, their knowing is creating. They're creating a legislation. Their will to truth is will to power. This aphorism invites the question, is will to power Nietzsche's own creation of values, or is it reflective of the context under which values are created? The subsequent aphorism implies the former on the grounds that the values created by the philosopher are determined by the times. Today, the taste of the time and the virtue of the time weakens and thins down the will. Nothing is as timely as weakness of the will. In the philosopher's ideal, therefore, precisely strength of the will, hardness, and the capacity for long-range decisions must belong to the concept of greatness. With as much justification as the opposite doctrine and the ideal of a dumb, renunciatory, humble, selfless humanity was suitable for an opposite age. We see then that Nietzsche's will to power doctrine is designed to oppose a trend. That is, it is timely in its untimeliness. This means by Nietzsche's own admission that the teaching is an appropriate teaching only for a specific time. When will to power is an appropriate teaching or whether it isn't will be determined by a standard distinct from and governing over any particular teaching. It is part of the task of the philosopher to determine what teaching is appropriate to the time. Nietzsche even claims in the final section of the chapter that the primeval law of things takes care to enforce class distinctions. In this case, the distinction between the many and the very few in the order of rank among states of soul. This standard is natural and not the mere creation of a philosophic legislator. Nietzsche continues to treat nature as a standard not simply dependent on human will in the chapter, Our Virtues. He refers to those who have been ill-favored by nature and their corollary type, the higher nature. These distinctions depend on the order of rank among people, which dictates that there be an order of rank also between morality and morality. Nietzsche's affirmation of independent natural standards reaches its peak with the claim that the basic text of homo natura must again be recognized. Nietzsche's self-proclaimed task is to translate man back into nature to become master over the many vain and overly enthusiastic interpretations and connotations that have so far been scrawled and painted over the eternal basic text of homo natura, to see to it that man henceforth stands before man, even today, hardened in the discipline of science. He stands before the rest of nature. This passage raises two questions for me. Is nature being used as a synonym for will to power, or is it replacing will to power? And two, what does Nietzsche mean by the eternal basic text of homo natura? Regarding the first question, I do not see how a thematic attempt to hoist a standard onto the whole devised out of a creative act of will can be made compatible with a pre-existing standard that one would have access to on the basis of contemplation. Therefore, I have to conclude that the experiment treating will to power as a causal unifying principle is a failure and one that allows for a revitalization of nature as a standard. Regarding the second question, how can Nietzsche speak of the eternal basic text of natural man as though man is unchanging, when so much of his work points to man as an animal subject to evolutionary change, that is, as a class or type that he expects will one day cease to exist? Perhaps Nietzsche implies that as a class, the natural characteristics of man are unchanging, regardless of what light will be shed on that class by having recourse to genealogy. The interpretation that Nietzsche is using a revitalized conception of nature at the expense of the will to power doctrine should be tested against the usage of will to power in our virtues. It occurs a few aphorisms before the aphorism uh, speaking of homo natura. In it, Nietzsche assimilates himself to both the free spirits and what he calls the last Stoics. We free spirits, we last Stoics. The subject of the aphorism is redlichite, probity or honesty. Nietzsche says that we must assist our redlichite with whatever we have in us of devilry, our disgust with what is clumsy and approximate, our nitimor invetium, or striving for the forbidden, our adventurous courage, our seasoned and choosy curiosity, our subtlest, most disguised, most spiritual will to power and overcoming of the world that flies and flutters covetously around all the realms of the future. However, after describing the qualities needed to assist Red Lukite, Nietzsche insists that we not become moralists on its behalf. Our Red Lukite, we free spirits, let us see to it that it doesn't become our vanity, our finery and pomp, our limit, our stupidity. 
Then each calls on our most spiritual will to power to assist our red lakite, harkens back to the first usage of will to power. Philosophy is this tyrannical drive itself, the most spiritual will to power, to the creation of the world, to the cause of prima. Are these two different ways of saying the same thing, or is the usage in our virtues reflective of development in the work? What is the relationship between the fundamentally creative aspect of philosophy and the piece of devilry that is called in to support red lakite? The intellectual conscience might be the virtue of a free spirit, but it can't be the only virtue of the philosopher. The philosopher legislates for humanity, and this means deliberately misleading, controlling how one will be misunderstood and not becoming a moral fanatic on behalf of Red Lakite. Will to power is never mentioned in the chapter Peoples and Fatherlands, the most time bound of the chapters in Beyond Good and Evil. However, Nietzsche does come close to doing so in an aphorism criticizing the democratization of Europe. After criticizing and leveling, excuse me, after criticizing the leveling and mediocratization of man involved in the democratization of Europe, he says that the democratization of Europe is at the same time an involuntary arrangement for the cultivation of tyrants, taking that word in every sense, including the most spiritual. The language of this aphorism is meant to call to mind and shed light on the usage in our virtues, as well as the first usage of the work. That democracy indirectly encourages new spiritual tyranny from the hands of philosophers, coupled with the thought that Nietzsche is a philosopher, points in the direction of a kind of tyrannical lawgiving on the part of Nietzsche. The last three usages occur within a single aphorism in the final chapter, what is noble. Nietzsche begins this aphorism with the claim that if the principle of equal rights is extended and possibly even accepted as the fundamental principle of society, it immediately proves to be what it really is, a will to the denial of life, a principle of disintegration and decay. The attack on democracy is supported by a comparison with a living body. Even the body within which individuals treat each other as equals, as suggested before, and this happens in every healthy aristocracy, if it is a living and not a dying body, has to do to other bodies what the individuals within it refrain from doing to each other. It will have to be an incarnate will to power. It will strive to grow, spread, seize, become predominant, not from any morality or immorality, but because it is living and because life simply is will to power. Again, exploitation does not belong to a corrupt or imperfect and primitive society. It belongs to the essence of what lives as a basic organic function. It is a consequence of the will to power, which is after all the will of life. As I mentioned in the opening of this talk, the will to power doctrine could have been used differently within the context of a different rhetorical aim. Are not Democrats alive? Don't the basic organic functions apply to Democrats? If they are weak as individuals or within subgroups, are they not strong when working as a coherent whole? Or in what way does the will to power of the groups of aristocrats that come together to overpower their enemies distinguish itself from the will to power of Democrats that come together to put down aristocracy? Nietzsche ends the aphorism with the claim that if this should be an innovation as a theory, as a reality, it is the primordial fact of all history. People ought to be honest with themselves at least that far. Now, towards the end of the work, Nietzsche presents himself as succumbing to self-pity. For example, he says things like, in a lizard, lost fingers, a lost finger is replaced again, not so in a man. This degeneration into self-pity peaks in a dialogue in which the one succumbing to self-pity is going back like anybody who wants to attempt a big jump. That is, Nietzsche presents himself as succumbing to self-pity as a way of showing how one would free oneself from a position of self-pity. And in this context, he claims to have an unconquerable mistrust of the possibility of self-knowledge and claims that this whole fact is the most certain thing he knows about himself. Artistic self-pity gives way to an acknowledgement of ignorance that points to a riddle and betrays the species to which he belongs. Further details surrounding the species to which he belongs are given in an aphorism on the hermit, which assumes that every philosopher was first of all a hermit. The hermit has access to the philosopher's thoughts without being a philosopher himself. The hermit does not believe that any philosopher ever expressed his real and ultimate opinions in books. Does one not write books precisely to conceal what one harbors? Indeed, he will doubt whether the philosopher could possibly have ultimate and real opinions, 
whether behind every one of his caves, there's not, must not be another deeper cave. Every philosophy is a foreground philosophy. Every philosophy also conceals a philosophy. Every opinion is also a hideout. Every word also a mask. And Nietzsche confirms these thoughts of the hermits in his own name in the subsequent aphorism. Every profound thinker is more afraid of being understood than of being misunderstood. The difference between the hermit and the philosopher then is that the philosopher is willing to present a teaching for public consumption. My conclusion is that the will to power teaching serves first of all to test an experimental unifying concept for determining the intelligible character of the world from within. I think this experiment must be considered a failure, although I don't consider the failure of the experiment a failure on the part of Nietzsche. Instead, the will to power teaching serves the additional functions of one, potentially developing the self-knowledge and understanding of some of Nietzsche's readers, while two, establishing itself as a powerful rhetorical tool to encourage spiritedness in a time of weak-willed degeneration. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we, we have, uh, I think secretly we have a lot of people under the, under the umbrella of Evan uh, Coulter. So we, I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of questions. Um, and uh, maybe and, people could use the raise hand function, Zarka. Yeah, yeah, they can use the raise hand function because we can see everybody on the same. Okay, uh, we have uh, um, Marina uh, first. Uh, you can pose a question to whoever you want to pose the question. Thank you, thank you, Zarka, and and thank you everyone for these very illuminating talks. I have a question for Alex. So I, <laughs> I've, I've heard you talk um, about Lucretius, and so I must have been hard of hearing instead of eager of ears, because <laughs> what I've heard today was nothing short of brilliant. So thank you very much for that. It was very illuminating. So I was thinking your talk made me think about um, Aristotle's De Anima uh, 35, specifically, you know, the very thorny <laughs> chapter. Um, in book three of De Anima, where we have this interplay between nous, nous poeticos, um, or, or the active intellect, and also, of course, then the potential intellect, which potential intellect for Aristotle there in the Anima 3.5 has no nature. And, and, and so I was thinking in the connection, I was trying to think the connection between your articulation of the void in the poem as this unknown, uncharted, unprescribed, I mean, something that on the one hand is clearly <laughs> lacking structure and articulation, but on the other hand, calls to perhaps being articulated precisely. And so this is this is where the nuance of the talk escaped me. So if you could, it's less of a question rather than um, um, a polite request for any further explanation and comment. If you could just give me a little bit more to think on this connection between the void, the way that you talked about it, and materialism in terms of material images that take on, as you put it, a shape of their own. I heard something like um, a metaphor or a power of poetry, this <laughs> metaphoric moment where we go from something that is quite palpably given to taking on a life of their own of these images, um, and, and, and yet this kind of hovering of imagination, being called out by a void. Maybe I am imagining things, but that's what I heard. So if you could just talk a little bit about this, uh, further about this connection between um, the void and materialization and the power of poetry, metaphoric power of poetry to call as if from the void upon that materializing of the images. Uh, sure. I think you're, I mean, I, I think you're pushing me a step beyond what I probably said today when it comes to sort of, the, as you say, the power of poetry to, to do this. Um, you know, my, what I, what, my suggestion about Void in this, in, in this paper was that, I mean, there's a lot to say about it elsewhere in the poem for its sort of place in physics and its sort of place in a form. In, the philosophy of it. Um, what's what's interesting about the way that it appears in the senses is that 
it seems to have a shape actually. And that shape, it's almost what you might call desire, right? It's almost, I use the word disposition or predisposition, something like that. It seems to, it seems to, to point us in different directions and make us receptive to something or not receptive to something else. Um, if you read the poem, uh, if you take a, 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 a step up one level and read the poem kind of with that in mind, I think that he is very often giving you images that are supposed to be filling a role in the argument, but maybe, <laughs> maybe show you something else. And so I guess what I'm suggesting is Lucretia seems to show us something about this sort of reader as hunting dog means that um, there is a kind of, we can build up our own kind of receptivity to the images he uses um, because we need to do that to understand the poem. <laughs> we can't, it's very difficult to, to um, I think we have to do this read the poem, period, I guess, to, to, to find the truth, drag out the truth, whatever it is he wants to do with it. So I think that's the connection as, 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 well, as, I can, as well as I can kind of put it. Um, but I think what you're suggesting probably is the next step here, which is to say, uh, yeah, something more explicit about the role of poetry, which I don't think I, I, don't think I said. So yeah, anyways, yeah, but I think that's, you're probably right about that. Um, cool. so, so just a really quick follow-up. So would you say then that, um, and maybe this is straightforward and kind of obvious, I apologize if it, if it is, that a method of the poem to understand and have a kind of a play of content, that this is a key for one of the ways to being attuned to the world and to thinking philosophically about the world. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, right, because I, so at the first, the, at the first level, Epicureanism, Epicureanism is meant to do that. The, the overt thesis of the thing is to change what you see when you see the world, right? You hear thunder, you don't get scared that it's a god, you know that it's any of the spurious explanations that the Epicureans have for what thunder is, and that's what doesn't scare you. Um, despite the fact that the, what you learn instead is that the entire world is crumbling under your feet and so are you in the midst of it. Um, so it's kind of, <laughs> kind of a mixed, a mixed message. Um, and that's the bitterness, right? That's the bitter lesson about the, about the world. Um, and so, yeah, I think that what, again, what, what I'm, tr I'm trying to, trying to get the most mileage I can out of, out of this very unusual thing that he says about, about hunting dogs and readers, that that maybe is not only a disposition we can have towards the poem itself, but is perhaps the philosophic disposition um, where you have to understand. I mean, it's something, it, it approaches something like the Socratic position, right? You have to know that you don't know something and that is not a, me, a reason to freak out. Instead, that is a reason to go and work um, in some way. So um, I think- So between think pacifying that's... acceptance and paralyzing doubt were your words, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, Ian has a question, I think, or at least a question about how to ask a question. No, that one was answered for me. Um, my, I, I have a little trouble formulating it as a question, but for Derek, um, Dionysus seems particularly associated with phantoms and appearances in a way that other gods don't. Um, that like. Other gods are more directly powerful, it seems to me, that they would just, you know, make something uh, change. Whereas Dionysus, at least more often than not, seems to make um, the appearance of something change for people as opposed to making the thing change. Um, so it's, it's kind of vague as my question, but like, do you, do you have a sense for, for why that is or something like that? Or why Dionysus has this special capacity? I mean, I mean, it's obviously related. I mean, I want to kind of emphasize again that Dionysus somehow is, you know, it's it's Dionysus is the god you want to think about if you want to think about about. Well, I don't know. I mean, let me see if I can 
you know, clarify your question. So your question is, what's significant uh, about the fact that Dionysus doesn't act directly, uh, he, but he seems to somehow be a kind of, how did you put it that he, that his action is always associated with phantoms or appearances or he mazes the minds of people instead of changing the thing directly as apparently a more powerful God would do or so it would seem, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, again, he seems to be this kind of sort of special God because he's the God of all the Greek gods, of the Olympian gods. He's the God that seems to be most obviously uh, reminds us or makes us aware of the artificiality of all the gods. I mean, if all the, you know, if all the, if all the Olympian gods are the gods of the poets, I mean, Dionysus is most explicitly so, it seems like in a way. Um, and I, so it seems like whatever power he represents is somehow connected to the power of poetry in human life. Um, in a way that, of course, you know, I don't think, even though that, you know, all the gods are, the, are somehow the effect of poetry or images of something, right, of some kind of human type or some kind of uh, psychological impulse, it seems like Dionysus somehow is, in a way, the most comprehensive of the gods because he encompasses somehow, you know, whatever it is that the poets hope to accomplish through the presentation of the gods in general. I don't know if that answers your question, but I do think you're right to point out that there's something, you know, special about whatever it is that Dionysus represents. I, I read Ovid recently, and when Dionysus appears, that's how he operates in the same fashion. He, he attacks people in this indirect fashion by changing their what they what they seem to see. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good observation, and um, I'll think more about it. But I mean, again, just this is a stupid point. Just to repeat, I mean, it seems to me that what's really kind of an issue in Dionysus is just the power of poetry in human life, what it can accomplish, what it does, how it operates. So you might know. find it interesting to look at the Ovid section. Well, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there's, a, there's a question out of uh, New Orleans. Very interesting. We need a couple hours for each of the four papers, I'm afraid. I also want to let you know that there are 10 of us here in the room enjoying it. We're going out for party for our lunch afterwards. So we'll have our own discussion. We wish you were all part of it. So thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to, it's so hard to put all four together in any way, but I think that what's some one of the themes running through it has to do with the possibility of the yoking of poetry for some. Purpose. I don't know if it's beyond poetry or if it's just the fulfillment of the poetry. But a couple of the thoughts I had in mind were, um, uh, first of all, let's start with Nietzsche at the end, that the idea of the creation of values and the legislating, that would be, I think, the rule that the ancients would ascribe to the poets above all. And so it's very weird to me or interesting to hear it ascribed to the philosopher the idea of the production and creation of values uh, and the will to power behind that. But I want to go backwards to um, the question, you know, how should we put this, that, let's say this, that Nietzsche thought, did not Nietzsche think at one point that Euripides was the death of tragedy and the Bacchae was the end of tragedy. And so I wonder, in making tragedy thematic and reflection, reflection on tragedy, does that entail the death of tragedy or the transformation of it into philosophy? And yet, everything you said so interesting about the Bacchae, and we could, you know, ultimately connect it to the role of comedy in the political world. Uh, it seems like the poets and the, uh, the turning of something into a mimetic work of art is such a crucial function for uh, a safety valve almost, or something along those lines. I don't know, that's what I was saying. It was very interesting. Thank you all. <laughs> this is at least for Derek and Ian. In a way, I think <laughs> that all, all the papers are somehow about what this, I mean, I'm getting into, I guess, a poet a quarrel between poetry and philosophy. But anything that anyone has to say is fine. I mean, uh, so the way that you put it, Rana, the, the, 
that this kind of creation of values would be the way that, you know, the, the way the ancients would have understood the function of poetry. And, uh, and that's how Nietzsche understands the function of philosophy. But I wonder, again, I mean, this is sort of an obvious point, but even, you know, for the ancients, right? It looks like, you know, poetry both is, again, poetry somehow both has a role to play within and without of the cave, right? Poetry both illuminates, it discloses something about reality through imitation, right? Um, and yet at the same time, of course, it, it does seem to kind of uh, create horizons. So, I mean, and I mean, I think we could probably obviously say that, you know, Plato's poetry operates similarly. So I wonder in a way how kind of, how distinct those two functions of poetry really are, or how distinct those two activities really are. That is value creation on the one hand and, you know, disclosure of reality through distortion. I mean, those seem to be connected. Yeah. But maybe not for Nietzsche, Alex, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I was inclined to agree with what you were saying and think that it um, was the same. Uh, basically, that, that poetry not only um, serves a function of creating values, uh, ancient and um, but also illuminates through imitation, but also I, I think that the, the philosophy of Plato would serve in some sense of a function of creating values as well. Um, so I, I don't have a good answer. It, it just sharpens the question in my mind as to what the like precise distinction between um, philosophy and poetry would be, or may, maybe in, in like a, a quarrel or just at all. Well, and let me, I just want to toss out one other thing that seems to run through all the papers connected to the issue, I think, of poetry, but is the issue of self-knowledge, which seemed to come out in various ways, I think, in each of your papers. Yeah. And also in connection with the recognition of a god as a god, which, I don't know, extends to all of them, but that's the appearances because we're all here reading Plato's sophist now, which begins with comparing the philosopher to that problem. It's on our minds here. Yeah. And maybe philosophy, maybe in the distinction at least, formalized, like self-knowledge becomes more thematic in, in philosophy. Or like I don't know, I think maybe it was Davis who said this or something like someone like him, but um poetry is not really about the poet, not obviously anyway. Whereas philosophy is more clearly about the philosopher than poetry is about the poet. And that's kind of what, I mean, that's sort of what I was interested in in, uh, in thinking about the Bach guy. And also this discussion of the Bach guy is related to, um, it's a part of a, another paper that's connected that also discusses the frogs. The frogs seem to be a meta poem in the same way that the frogs is a, is a comedy about tragedy. But, uh, but what's interesting is in both of them, it seems like there is a kind of reflection, or I want to say there, see if there is a kind of reflection on poetry or the role of the poet. Whereas, as you say, I think frequently, often, it seems like, actually, I mean, even in Homer, though, there is, I mean, through the kind of, uh, you know, the singers who sing songs, I mean, there's a kind of account of poetry there, too. But generally speaking, you're right, and I wonder if this, this element of, right, so if, you know, if the Bacchae is somehow in Nietzsche's view, the death of tragedy, and a part of what makes that, I wonder if part of what makes that so is the fact that somehow the poet seems to be, seems to insert himself or thematize himself in his own activity in a way that's in Nietzsche's view, anti-poetic or something. And that would be connected with also comedy replacing tragedy, since the comic poet does come forth. Right. right. Have, uh, yeah, Philosophy is closer to comedy. I don't know if there's more people from New Orleans, but Professor Warner, and we can always go back and. Uh, thank you, Zarko. I have uh, two questions, one for Derek and one for Marina. Uh, for Derek, I expected you to talk about the chorus, the Bacchae, the followers of Dionysius, who represent in some way from the inside this Dionysian spirit, it looks as if it would be a way of explicating this notion of the play being a tragedy about tragedy. So my question, and then I'll just state Marina's question, uh, if you could explore that a little bit. Uh, and 
for uh, Marina, uh, it looks to me what I expected you to talk about was the role of Schumer, not so much in democracy as a political enterprise, but something that might be called democratic culture in some, the spirit of democracy. And the way in which humor or laughter might mute or render nugatory the thematic impulses that make political life so problematic. So instead of reading Bexon, if you had read the generation before Baudelaire, uh, who in his work on the essence of caricature and laughter claims that laughter is satanic. We, we use it to ridicule, to besmirch, uh, to belittle the other, uh, which hardly seems as if it would be a salutary impulse uh, in democratic life. Uh, so those are the two questions that, that I have to try to give both of you a chance to explore a little bit more your papers. Marina, do you want to go first, actually? I'm trying to find a passage. Thank you. No problem, I will. Um, so right before this meeting, uh, I was reading Baudelaire and I'm very aggravated by what he has to say because every now and again, he's an excellent psychologist, but every now and again, well, more often than not, um, there's a lot of moralizing. Not that he is moralizing, but he is coming at humor from the angle of moralization of the world infused by Christianity. And so perhaps it's a caricature, a work on caricature that itself is caricaturistic and that escapes me. It's very possible. I, of course, will be rereading. But Baudelaire is not the way to go, not for me. Because what I'm interested in is something that I have learned from you, Stuart. And perhaps you've learned it from someone else. You should tell me that's the case. But what I've learned is that Thumos is essential for justice. In fact, <laughs> every time I, I, I talk to my students about um, ancient Greek philosophy and justice and introduction to philosophy courses, what I have to say is that inflaming thumos is problematic. So demagoguery of sorts or fear mongering, all these things are, are, are deeply troublesome, but no thumos, no standing up for someone who is being belittled or bullied. And so that is critical. Mm, and here I uh, trip close to Strauss, problem of Socrates, where he tells us that the Republic is a work that incites our sentiment, thematic sentiment for justice, but in order to purge it. In other words, if we're thinking about laughter and comedy from the point of view of Baudelaire and <laughs> taking a kind of position in it as being problematic because it is rooted in the thematic Satanism of our nature, then I think we've missed the point. But again, I have to read further and reread in order to have a strong position developed on this. But what I am interested in in um, the paper that, that I've given today and in a longer version is the way in which comedy throws humor, has a capacity, power to throw a wrench into the prescribed pre-categorized, pre-charted order of things. And by thereby to disrupt our common views and opinions on matters, especially thematic ones. In other words, if a joke is well made and well received, then what we get is not the, not the incitement of the thematic within us, or at least not just that, but also a relief that then if taken over by education in the way that I was trying to articulate it in today becomes an impetus for questioning about oneself, becomes an impetus for asking a question, well, why do I find this so hilarious? And what if I was the butt of the joke <laughs> in these circumstances, right? So I take this very seriously on what Socrates tells us about um, the nature of the ridiculous and the philebus that it is the other side of the coin, which on the other side, right, as is the nature of the ridiculous is the opposite of, the, of that which the prescription at Delphi recommends. And the prescription at Delphi, of course, recommends Kenokitel, right? So these are part and partial of 
one another, ignorance and the possibility of self-knowledge, never complete, never final, never wholesale, ever ongoing. But, and, and I just don't see how thematic can be excised from this. I think it's critically important. And again, I'm pretty sure I learned this from you. So if I misunderstood you, please forgive me. Stuart, did you want to respond to her? No, oh, I can go next. No, go ahead, Derek. Yeah, please. I was just going to say, you, know, you make a really good point, and I really need to think more about the chorus and the play, which is sort of puzzling. I mean, well, let me first say one part just to kind of to sort of uh, to kind of support your suggestion is that the entire play ends actually with this kind of strange remark by the chorus, which seems to be sort of self-reflexive. So the chorus says in the very end, I'm going to read it. It goes, the gods have many shapes. The gods bring many things to their accomplishment. And what uh, was most expected has not been accomplished, but God has found his way for what no man expected. So ends the play, whatever, to translation. But so there, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's this kind of, I think, sort of playful, again, so, sort of self-reflexive remark by the chorus where, you know, it's suggesting some kind of principle of divine providence. And then you remember that, you know, what's actually, if there's any kind of fate or any providence operating in the play, it's, the plot, you know, it's what the poet's done. So it seems like in a certain way, the chorus here is pointing toward the poet, suggesting something about the poet, the role of poetry. Uh, but, you know, the chorus in this play is strange to me, to me and I'm not quite sure what uh, perspective it's supposed to represent entirely. And I'm not sure if I wanna go so far as to identify it with the perspective of the poet, because, you know, it's these Asian initiates who apparently, again, never even are able to recognize uh, Dionysus in his disguise. So, you know, in a certain way, they don't seem like, I don't know what to make of this exactly, but, you know, he remains in disguise even to them throughout the entire play. So, of course, they're worshiping him and they attribute much of what's happening to Dionysus's power, but they also understand the stranger to be a mere stranger, a kind of prophet, right? So, it's not clear. I'm not, I'm not entirely clear what to make of the limitations of their own perspective or why it seems that they're presented as not having full knowledge of Dionysus here. Yeah, I mean, one thing to think through in this regard is the role of Tiresias. Yeah. Who because of his unique quality or lack thereof is a stranger in Thebes, which turns out to be a strange land. Right. right founded by Cadmus, a strange, whatever it is, whatever it is that, that he is. Um, which leads me, by the way, to comment on your formula, a tragedy about a tragedy, on a tragedy. I think it's a very equivocal remark. That is, is the tragedy that's the substance of the play itself. Is there something tragic about the presentation of it? Or is there a different sense of the tragedy? Of, I so, conceive there at least three different senses of what that might mean, and it seems so fundamental. Well, I, it's because of my own confusion about that, I actually changed the title of my paper after you sent around that. So my revision is now, <laughs> no, I'm not joking. I actually sent around a flyer to people of Clemson and I changed the title to, uh, 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 the tragedy of Dionysus uh, on the Balkan <laughs> to kind of <laughs> to get around my own confusion about this, but you're right. Because um, again, in the end, I don't think that um, I don't think the play itself. Uh, in other words, I don't think Euripides is a tragic figure, or that his art is a tragic uh, is tragic necessarily. But I do think here he's presenting something about. Well, I mean, what is the tragedy of Dionysus? So again, to the extent that I want to make a distinction between Dionysus uh, and Euripides, right? I don't want to simply collapse them, even though I do think Dionysus is meant to be a kind of representative of tragedy. I don't think that, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I want to say something like, I don't know, I want to say something like, Again, the issue in the play with Dionysus is this incapacity for him to, again, be recognized. That's what he wants. He wants to be recognized. But 
to be recognized is to no longer be Dionysus if what it means to be Dionysus is to be an illusionist or a god of disguise, you know? Mm. And in a way, maybe that's connected also to a kind of issue, a, a, a kind of tragic aspect of poetry that for the poets to, you know, I mean, for the poets to really do what they do, they have to, in a way, kind of stay out of the picture, you know, that, that you know, there has to be verisimilitude. You have to believe that this is real. And right. when you begin to think of the poets as poets, right, somehow their spell breaks. So maybe, I don't know, maybe there is a kind of necessary identification of Dionysus with the poets or with Euripides even too, as a kind of illusionist, as a, as, you know, as someone whose art has to somehow be opaque to the audience. But I don't know, I, I'm really thinking about it still. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have Alex Limanowski next. Uh, thanks, Arco. So I wanted to try kind of the same in our last two commenters, uh, sort of a bank shot here from uh, Derek to Marina. Um, Derek, I wondered, you mentioned, and I just kind of wanted you to talk a little bit more about it. You mentioned that it sounded like something in the play kind of overcomes what you described, the universalizing of politics. Um, I wonder just if you could sort of kind of give us a little bit more of that. Um, and and I, I think it's sort of clear how tra tra tragedy or, or how drama poetry gives us some, give us maybe gives us a wedge <laughs> to get out of that situation. Um, and then I wanted to go from there and, and, and ask Marina um, whether there's any, um, any concern about a universalizing of politics if something like the spreading of Socratic virtue becomes almost like a political project. I mean, it's some, something like an, it's sort of an enlightenment idea. Is there any, is there any concern that a project as, as, as good and kind and benevolent and rational as Mills tries to wrap everything up into one and, and, we, and we can't really laugh at anything anymore. I, I just wonder, is there, any, is there any concern about that or not um, in, in what you've read? I'll, I'll go really quickly. So Alex, I think, you know, again, I think it's not incidental that, you know, obviously not incidental that the setting of the black guy is Thebes, right? So Thebes is a city in which, you know, the myth is or that the intention is, right? That it's presented as a kind of natural place, right? The citizens grow from the ground, uh, that somehow it's the place in which nature and convention are collapsed, somehow united, somehow the city is completely natural. And, um, but of course that's a deception. And so what ends up happening is the city present in presenting the city in presenting itself as natural ends up eliminating any place for the natural, for the genuinely natural. So it somehow again becomes a kind of closed cave, right? And in that sense, it's universalizing in its effort to stamp out or to eliminate any place for the uh, the intrusion of nature. And um, and I think that again, you know, Pentheus is a kind of tyrant, or Oedipus is a kind of tyrant, right? Um, somehow, it's, I mean, this kind of effort to be again uh, devoted to the city that has this pretense to be natural. It's connected, it seems like, to the to the uh, the psychology of the tyrant and his uh, his uh, aspiration to be wholly public or something like that. So. Those are just a jumble of thoughts there, but again, I'm thinking, I guess, about the eliminate the universalization of the universalization of politics seems to me to be the consequence of the elimination of nature, the replacement of politics, the replacement of nature with politics. If that makes sense. That, no, that's true. So yeah, I mean, I guess that's why my 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 follow up is to run about does the does the enlightenment have any seeds that threaten in that direction or, or, um, or, or not? For a second there, I, I lost you. And I wish I had a really neat transition from Derek's uh, politics as overtaking a totalization of nature is, is problematic, but I don't. So I'm just going to say what I saw in, in Mill and in On Liberty. Um, and so his concern, he voices it, and the concern is that effectively you can have a kind of utilitarianist framework that pursues 
as an understanding of the pleasurable, the lowest common denominator. So he is acutely aware of this, of the necessity in especially a democratic, perhaps not a regime, but a society that a culture follows the spirit of democracy. He is very acutely aware of this, that what is essential is the kind of education that cultivates an aesthetic taste of, of, of a, that leads then to a flourishing of a unique individuality. Right, because if we do not have that, then we end up with a kind of proliferation of what's the easiest to get, and the pleasures of the lowest common denominator that require the least effort, so on and so forth. And so that's effectively mill. So, the, but, but, but it, my understanding of a potential problem that you're bringing up um, with a recommendation that there is a kind of panacea <laughs> to, um, perils of politics, to, to democracy or otherwise, right? So this search for self, self-knowledge, the way that I articulated having to do with comedy um, and uh, trying to take over from this power, the unleashing, unleashing power of humor that can, un not unhinge, but unleash our imaginative capacity to then taking over of this power by the project, by the educational project, I think you're right that there could, as a, with every good intention, once we start prescribing things and kind of laying down programs, as with every good intention as such, there could be grave pitfalls, but perhaps because of the focus on self-knowledge, not on the self, right, not on the egotistical kind of me, I, mine preference of here I stand and I'm unique <laughs> without having thought about the world and my place in it, but because of the focus on self-knowledge, a kind of enterprise that, again, cannot be bought wholesale, that is ever ongoing, and because of the uniqueness of that one who is searching for herself, if we are to follow Mill through rigorous education, right, he tells us in his address to the University of St. Andrews that universities for him are emphatically not for professional training, right? So proliferation of ethics courses would not be something that Mill would be comfortable with insofar as his moral program is concerned. And so I'm going to bring this to a close to say that I completely agree. I myself am not a fan of didacticism, prescriptions, <laughs> structures that universalize, not at all, but I, I, I do see a possibility here. And this is something that um, is not exactly my area of expertise. I mean, I am uh, I've written a book on ancient philosophy on, on Plato and the Republic, but this is something I'm branching out into, and, but about humor and Aristophanes, I have thought carefully and the connection between humor and self-knowledge. And I think there's something there to withstand that onslaught of leveling out and universalization that, that you are rightfully worried about. Thank you, yeah. There was someone at Tulane, uh, uh, I don't know if still stands, if, if not uh, Professor Warner and then De Derek, but is, was there, is there someone at Tulane who wishes to ask a question? Okay. Not immediately. Let's go with Professor Warner. Okay, but Derek, were you on what the conversation just concerned because I was going to take a different path? You're muted. Okay, I, I guess I'll go my way. Uh, this is a question for Alex. Uh, for a very long time in your work on Lucretius, you've been trying to show uh, in what way he uh, distinguishes himself from Epicurus. And in the context of your paper, I wonder if the beginning of Book four of the Remnator doesn't provide a certain way into that. And I'd be interested for you to comment on it. And what I have in mind is this, surely it's pivotal to Lucretius that philosophy proceed poetically, hence this philosophical poem. And book four is the paradigmatic example of the power of images of both the image and the simulacra uh, that dominate. And in fact, our experience of nature is imagistically, <laughs> it's, it's through images. So I wonder if philosophy and it's an attempt to understand nature 
has to proceed directly through the mechanism by which we understand nature. And that's through images. And the best way to convey that is poetically. I'd be interested to hear what you might have to say. So is that, I mean, are, would that end up being kind of a poetic second sailing? I mean, is that sort of the idea that because yeah. we because we, because we really only have I mean there is something you know uh, yeah that whatever water the simulacra theory holds for vision um, it's indirect right we we only get the <laughs> we're not seeing the things we're seeing these pieces of the things that fly off at us and and, and hit us in the eyes um, constantly <clears throat> and yeah all of the as as he as he goes. What he seems to be a pains to show there is that the uh, illusions created when we look at things in the world and see them incorrectly, that which we then can prove if we walk closer to the tower, we can see that it's round and not square, or square and not round. Um, if we, you know, take our stick out of the water, we can see that it's not really bent. That sort of thing. Um, that those illusions are our misinterpretation of it. So. so so yeah, I mean, so what you're saying, is it necessary, does he think it's necessary to ask any kind of, <laughs> any, any kind of question about nature to go through first what we think we see and then mm -hmm. kind of, yeah, work from there, work, work from the image somewhat higher, <laughs> higher than the image, but maybe not we never we kind of are kept from the thing itself um, in a way. And I mean, his poetry, maybe does, I, I suppose you're right. Maybe his poetry shows that obviously in it being a poem and the primacy of the image um, in that respect. I mean, and, and, and it's strange that, I mean, he, he goes on and on about the simulacra and then he does the interruption of the other senses, and then he goes back basically to the simulacra, but it's a different kind and they're smaller. And they're the ones that are in your mind. And it's the same thing, apparently, right? Except you can't control it as well. Where does it come from? Nobody knows. Where, how, why do you have so many? It's not clear. But somehow your will is operating on them. Your attention is operating on them at that point. Um, that seems to be thinking with images or or asking questions and answering them with images uh, does seem to be entirely Im imagist. Th thought seems to be entirely imagistic um, in that in that section. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's why I mean that would be it'd be interesting to say if we are filled with doubt about how much we can prove or know about uh, you know optics, we can at least make some progress by considering how we, uh, considering imagistically how we see the world and how we think about the world at the same time and, and can even just manipulate those images. And that's, that's the work, that's thinking somehow. Sorry, that was kind of a, all over the place, but okay. But I, I just wanna cl clarify this, so, I mean, of course, a, mo a modern neuroscientist wouldn't mind images. I mean, is an Im this is a big question. What is an image? And they don't mind dis discussing images. So it's so just by emphasizing the importance of images, you're not deviating from a mechanistic materialistic science. Or maybe you, I mean, maybe mo modern neuroscience is confused and should deny the existence of images. Um, but it does, but it doesn't. It's all about images, computer vision and what and what and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, no, I only meant to say that with, within the, within the um, standards that Lucretius lays down for us, that he gives this weird, as, as, as Bailey calls it, a, con a, con a, a bizarre concession at the end of his explanation of the simulacra that seems to just kneecap it, right? I mean, why say this might, this could be false, who cares? It doesn't matter, it's doing some good for us. It's a, it's a strange, um, it's a strange thing to say after going on for like, you know, 400 lines about it. Um, and 
he doesn't always do that. He doesn't always he doesn't always take the you know take the supports out from under what he said. So that's that's all I was saying is the literal truth of Epicurean materialism seems like it's undermined in the poem. And yet there seems to be plenty we can learn about at least the way people think um, and at least the way people kind of interact with the world, the human, the human things in other words, seems to be opened up for us by this exploration of atomism, um, which, which, which would seem on the other hand to destroy the human things or to make them un un unnecessary in some way. Um, we have, um, let, let, let's spend another 10, 15 minutes, I guess, so people are gonna get hungry soon. Uh, we have uh, Derek's question, and then at least one question out of Tulane, possibly nine questions out of out of Tulane. Uh, yeah, I, Alex, I wanted to ask. I mean, I think this question can maybe go to the entire group too. But it seems like the way we're using poetry and images is kind of equivocal. Like, you know, earlier Marina was referring to you know poetic intellect, and you know, and, and in De Anima, of course, Aristotle talks about right how. You know, you think the Noah Ta and the Phantasma Ta. So there's a way in which thinking is essentially poetic. You think through images. And, and, and yet, I mean, that kind of poetic aspect of thinking, right? I mean, is that, obviously it's linked, but how is that related to poetry in the more kind of precise sense? Like, you know, Lucretius writes a poem, but it's a poem in which he's also describing the way that thinking operates through images. So it just seems like I'd like to kind of clarify I, you know, how those two are related. In other words, you know, thinking that you have to sort of express uh, a philosophical position or thought uh, poetically uh, and the reality of thinking as something which operates through images, if that makes sense. I mean, it seems like there's this very comprehensive way in which thinking is poetic, but then it also seems like there's this other related issue that's more stylistic or something, but maybe it's more Maybe, I mean, maybe it's not merely stylistic, but I wonder what you guys think about how those two le levels are related. Well, I think, I mean, I would be interested to hear what the, what the rest of you would say about this because I, what's unusual, we, a previous question was around sort of the poetry and philosophy contrasted. Um, and it occurred to me that, you know, in, in Lucretius, it's almost, he, he goes back, I didn't mention this in this paper, but he goes back and talks about, about myth and says, but more or less shows that myth was created by poets, he calls them, who were trying to convey physics kind of, or politics, they seem, it, he seemed almost to run together, the poets and the philosophers. And, the, and to the extent that we get the kind of picture of a, of a, of a mystifier, or some of the words that, that especially were prevalent when thinking about Di the, the, the Dionysiac approach to, to image making maybe, which what's the, what's the goal? <laughs> How does it affect you? And, and so on. Actually, this is, and this is where I, I think it's, I'm on, I'm on shaky ground here. In Lucretius, that seems to actually be the role of Epicureanism, that philosophy in fact, once it becomes too much of a, this is sort of the quote that Ian started with, once it becomes too much of a just way of defining the world and redefining the world, it is the thing that actually blinds you perhaps. And poetry by approaching things obliquely or by knowing the image as image actually is less mystified <laughs> than the alternative. But I don't know if that's, actually a crazy reversal of how it usually is in all of the other authors, or if they all sort of see that, um, that distinction. So, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear more. I, get, I, I guess I'd hear from Ian, but I'd also hear from you. And, and yeah, I, I thought um, the, the way will to power was used and then the way, as far as I can tell, it, it, it become it backs off of it. Um, mirrored the Socratic turn in a certain sense, in that um, it was, I mean, especially once it starts taking over physics and, and, and becomes an explanation for everything, the way a physicist might 
try to give a kind of explanation for everything. It seemed like, um, oh, just that will to power was performing something like the function of um, pre-Socratic or scientific inquiry. Um, and, and then that led to what I take to be an impossible position. And I, I, th I think there's, I mean, my paper would have to be twice as long to show this, I suppose, but I think there's plenty of evidence inside Beyond Good and Evil that a kind of um, non-perspectival position is just not one that you can have. Like there's no such thing as like a bird's eye view in this way. Um, that the, But will to power takes on a position of being a, a sort of bird's eye view. Um, so yeah, I, I thought I thought will to power w w was a kind of sort of mythical <laughs> Socratic, a uh, pre-Socratic scientific understanding of things. If, if, but did I answer your question or not? I might, I might have wanted. I think so. Is playing the flute the alternative? Yeah, I mean, I I, I took that to be a kind of playing the flute. Oh, Nietzsche presenting a pre-Socratic view. Yeah. Is, okay. I was no. What I was saying is, what is the there's the, there, there's this all encompassing all, all encompassing pre-Socratic view. But what's how does Nietzsche get out of that? How does he how, how does he? Um, yeah. Well, I think you would have to first of all back off of the um, claim that it's your interaction with. I don't know, you say like the rest of the world isn't simply like an act of creative interpretation that there has to be a kind of um, adjusting yourself or reflectiveness of, of what other there is. Um, you know, I, in, in, in Zarathustra, um, in the second book, he, he, uh, Zarathustra talks about will to power and then, um, I don't know, it's been a little since I've looked at this, but he has some sort of experience and seems to back off of will to power in favor of um, the unharnessed will. And uh, sp speaks in that context of how the hero needs to become the overhero. And I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, that there, there's like a transition from a kind of spirited understanding of things to a kind of attempt to, um, well, back away from spiritedness. So how, how this exactly works, I'm not entirely clear. Um, I'm getting some of this from Meyer's uh, Zarathustra book. Uh, and and in, in the fourth um, book, there's a middle part called uh, Noon where, uh, the Zarathustra character um, seems to unify, I guess would be the way it's, that you would say it, but that, that the, the active and the passive part of human beings and of thinking seems to sort of merge and he almost sort of blacks out. Um, Meyer calls this an example of the unharnessed will. Um, so I don't know what to say, except that that might be a chapter to look at um, if, if, if one wants to see what a, a peak lack of spiritedness in relationship to experiencing nature would look like um, in, in Nietzsche's thought. The, the noon chapter is the 10th. I mean, the, the, the 10th section of book four. Good, uh, Sorry, uh, Derek. I didn't mean to hijack your question there. If you want, if you wanted to follow up on it. Well, let's see whatever questions we have out of out of Tulane. Well, first of all, Richard Melville had to leave. He said thank you all. He found very interesting. I don't know if you can see him there, but uh, we, you have a rapt audience here, but you're not getting into this microphone. So I'm going to uh, now. We're in the middle of Mardi Gras revelry here, <laughs> and I have to go back to the Bacchae for that reason. Here's what I'm wondering. It's about the danger of conflating or allowing to meld the, the fictional world of the poet. Oh, I know we have to go back to the images, but with reality and political reality. And I guess my question, I think this might be kind of a simple question about the play. 
you know, someone said Pentheus is a tyrant. How about Pentheus is the model of a rational man? So, in the, you know, until he's uh, taken over. And he's ruling the city. These women are crazy when he lets it go. They're gonna, the mother is going to dismember her son. I mean, this is not good stuff, right? That's going to happen. And had he stayed, I think better daddy emphasis, the emphasis of being armed, you know, had been his state of armed, if uh, he had kept somehow gotten control over the madness and stuff. And also, it's about religion. Like, who would believe this crazy Semele story, which I guess is also the New Testament story, but, um, you know, so. And this is a rationalist. I'm very attracted to him. I wish he would have stayed. And what's this purring interest coming up there? Is that the turning point? That, is that what Euripides um, pinpointing? That had it not been for that, he might have kept some kind of a sense of sanity and let this other stuff be on stage. Wait, what was the part that you, I, did, I didn't quite hear you said, the, uh, which turning point were you referring to? You know, this idea that he actually has some prurient interest. So, in yeah. the end, he's resented. You know, what I think this is about a lot of the politicians who want a normal majoritarian kind of politics. You often find out it's extremely self hatred motivated, and all that stuff. So, yeah. it's weird. Is that what? Why couldn't, could, is Europe suggesting that Pentheus might have been the uh, somehow something we should admire? And it has a lot of implications, right? It's anti-theological iron in some form. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. I think that it, that's actually really interesting. He does seem rational in, in a certain way um, in a world that's going mad. But I, I think that maybe the issue is that, I mean, this is just, again, an obvious point, but, you know, is it really rational to, uh, you know, to dig one's head in the sand as willful as he willfully as he, willfully as he does. I mean, so you know, it looks like he should at least you know arrive at his sort. Of, I mean, look. <laughs> ultimately, you know, he, ultimately he is somehow responsible for what happens. I mean, and if he had just kind of well, I don't know. It's actually a good question. If he had acknowledged Dionysus's divinity to begin with, what then would have been the outcome? And I mean, of course, I think that, you know, there's every reason why he should be suspicious of this story of this new prophet, this new religion, you know, in the beginning, but after he actually sees with his own eyes, you know, these miracles, these strange phantoms, the whole situation in the barn where, you know, there's, you know, the barn shaking, you know, et cetera. I mean, at that point, it certainly is irrational, is it, to continue to deny uh, Dionysus' divinity at great, you know, at great expense to both himself and to Thebes. You know, better than he has that line about uh, when you go to the theater, you have to undergo the willing suspension of disbelief. But Euripides has now presented this as a story about what's really going on. And I guess another thing, this is all way too much you now, but just the relation between Dionysus as the god of the, of the tragedy or the, the theater and the punitive because what you just said is true, right? Maybe if Pentheus had just acknowledged this is the myth of Thebes, you know, let it go. And I guess that's what Cadmus wants. So had they just, um, had he accepted that, would all this tragedy not, and madness not have taken over the whole society? Um, but this punitive, this intensely punitive character is a weird, you know, difficult to put together for, in my mind with the god of the theater. Yeah. Right. Um, may, I, may I add one thing to that? So, are, I mean, isn't Pentheus his name? Isn't that important? Isn't it a word play on Pentheus on mourning or sorrow throughout the play? Mm -hmm. I mean, I count at least three allusions to it. So, a, any attempt, I think, Rana, to offer Pentheus as this rational figure dealing with a, the political difficulties of his plays would have to take into account that the interior of this character points to something sorrowful. That itself would have to be relieved rather than serving as an instrument to achieve that relief or a solve to whatever the political difficulties are. 
in Jesus. I wonder, I mean, do you think that he could be, I mean, is Pentheus something like, you know, a kind of erotic tyrant? I mean, even though he appears to be, you know, opposed to all things aphrodisian, I mean, it, in the end, it looks like there is some kind of way in which what you say is right, Rana, that there's some kind of, you know, you know, some sort of sleazy desires deep down uh, that, you know, that Dionysus's, you know, visit to Thebes has provided the occasion uh, to unleash. So I wonder if in a way, I mean, this is a question for you. I mean, do you think that he could be understood, his psychology could be understood on the, on the model of something like the erotic tyrant? Like what kind of tyrant? Erotic. Yeah. 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 Just whether or not, whether or not he's a, a kind of erotic tyrant. I think I really want to read the play again, you know, <laughs> it's so interesting. Is, is that an end or, you know, is there something to this idea that he started out okay. This cannot go on. You cannot let this happen in the world. Uh, but what is being suppressed is coming back to onto him. That might be the meaning of mourning of his character and of his name. You know, Dionysus for sure. Dionysus seems to look like a god less than the other gods, too. I mean, I think that. Uh, He's, I mean, he's born of a, a woman and the father is uncertain. And then in his power, it seems more to just affect the minds of people rather than be a, a direct source of power. Um, so the question becomes like, to what extent is he different than a normal man? Or how does he distinguish himself from a normal man? And I think like the terror aspect <laughs> seems to be a major way of how he does it. <laughs> like ramping. Isn't it also the problem that Dionysus is the harsh prototo for the problem of recognition of the God? He's the encapsulates the problem. So Aristophanes was onto this uh, same use of Dionysus as paradigmatic. Definitely. And I mean, maybe in a way, I, you know, I've been emphasizing, you know, again, this sort of you know, the illusion, the illusionist part of Dionysus or the self-concealed part of Dionysus as being what links him up so obviously, right, to poetry, right, or to theater, right, wearing costumes. Or something. But also it seems like in a way you could maybe say that Dionysus seems to be the god that, um, you know, maybe in a way seems to and somehow instantiate religion, right? So faith, belief, right, in a certain way, in a world in which the gods are directly interacting with you, in which they're not concealed, I mean, that's a different kind of world than one in which you're not quite sure what's out there, what's operating, and in a certain way, you know, the, the point of religion, right? The reason why you need it as a kind of intermediary between, you know, yourself and the gods is because there's a kind of concealment there. So maybe Dionysus can be somehow representing the power not only of poetry in life, but of religion, the religious sort of psychology in life or something like that. Mm -hmm. And also lately I've been thinking a lot about why this idea of guest friendship or, you know, treating the stranger well because it might be a god in disguise. Why that's so central, right, from home, all the, all of the Odyssey, all of it, and that it has to do with this problem we're talking about. And that somehow it seems like this incarnation of God is connected with, of course, recognizing the human, and the unknown human being. And so it's very, it's like the central great theme in a way. Yeah. But I think we can, we can stop at this peak, peak moment. Thank you again, all of you for a wonderful presentation. This was so much Thank more, you. this was so much better than the APA, I'm so yeah. glad. <laughs> 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 and, and Gabrielle has brought her child. Augie. Have you named your child Hobbes or Locke? August. <laughs> His dad is right here too. Alan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we right. for lunch. And also, I'm announcing that.
Richard has a king cake for everybody. <laughs> We're talking about king cake. Uh, but, this is why doing it on Zoom doesn't quite work as well as <laughs> doing it in person. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for coming. Zarko, thank you. Uh, and uh, we'll have this up on our YouTube feed. I'll send out an email to everyone uh, within the next week. Uh, it'll be up. Uh, and well, by the way, before we go, I think maybe congratulations are due to one of our number, uh, Derek. That's right. Yeah. Would you, like to, would you like to make a public verbal announcement? I will. This will. Yeah, I will. So I'm uh, very, very happy. I, I accepted a tenure track position in the Department of Philosophy at Assumption University. And so just found out about it last week. So grateful to have uh, to be able to think into the future a little bit. Very good. Uh, at the risk of a mixed metaphor, Mazel Tov. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, you're welcome and thank you for uh everyone for coming and uh be well take care thank you guys so much yes bye-bye